Welcome back to Guaranteed Audio, the official podcast for Guaranteed Video. It's not a fan cast. This is straight from the horse's mouth. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, Ides of August 2019, and we are here to bring you some new audio content. I'm Kevin James, joined by Ryan Murphy and Neil Cesariga. And uh, we are extemporaneously podcasting because they put out a new Invader Zim and a new Rocco movie. And Ryan, you have some time off from work. I do. It would be weird. (laughs) It would be weird for us to not acknowledge this kind of 90s uh, Nickelodeon nostalgia. I mean, this is right up our alley. Yeah, really. Not a lot of fanfare. I mean, sort of in some ways, like these these are in the news and stuff, but... The, I, I feel like it was bigger news when these were announced than it was when they came out. It's crazy that the scary stories to tell in the dark movie came out a week ago. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you saw it, right? I, yeah, yeah. And, and just, I even asked last night, like I got home at like 11 o'clock at night from a concert and I texted you two going, hey, do you just want to get together tomorrow and do this? And are we ambulance chasing? And we were, you guys were like, no. No, we can talk about this. This is <laughs> this like, is, Kevin, this is for us. <laughs> it's thematically appropriate. Who did you go see last night? I saw, oh yeah, media current time. Uh, If if you've never listened to our show, our first segment is usually what the hell we've all been up to. It's kind of a way to pat out the show and get the uh, wheels greased, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's not racist to Italians, is it? Uh, Uh, To cars. (laughs) Yeah, Italian cars. That's that's topical (laughs) too. Last night, my girlfriend Hillary and I made our way to the Xfinity Center, which is the concert place in Mansfield, Massachusetts, where we saw the Goo Goo Dolls, and apparently Train was playing. We didn't really know. We bought our tickets a while ago <laughs> just to see the Goo Goo Dolls. And every now and then we'd be like, oh, yeah, and I guess Train's going to be there. You're really trying to make it sound like an accident that you saw Train. It was an accident. Like, But the Train was like kind of the headliner in a weird way. Even though the tour is the Goo Goo Dolls summer tour, Train was the closer. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure why. It should it should really be a battle of the bands kind of thing. I'd love to see them go up against each other. I think the Goo Goo Dolls are bigger. Oh, I think the Goo Goo Dolls have way more cultural capital in this fight. Than, That's yeah. what you'd think, but Train has a, a lot more hits than you realize. But not more than Goo Goo Dolls. Well, no, yeah, they're the they're also one of those bands that are just like, oh, they did this, they did this, that all makes sense, you know? Yeah. Um, I'd like to see them play, Goo Goo plays one song, Train plays another. <laughs> and they have an applause meter Yeah, applause meter <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, so the Goo Goo Dolls has been a bucket list <laughs> band of mine for a long time. Mm-hmm. They're not like my favorite band, but I definitely bought Goo Goo Dolls albums when they were coming out in like 2000, 2002. Like I love like, uh, what was it? Like Let Love In and stuff like that, like, yeah. which is such a Goo Goo Dolls album title. Um, but it was cheap. You know, we went and saw them. We got really good seats. They played exactly 60 minutes. There was a big clock on the side of the stage I could see clear as day and they got to their last (laughs) song and you could just see Johnny Resnick the lead guitarist every now and then looking over his shoulder at the clock to make sure like okay we're at 59 minutes let's just uh, pad this song out and 60 minutes and they like just wrapped up the lights turned off that's fascinating actually like seeing behind the curtain that yeah it was I've seen that happen before when I went to a Earthfest show that was nothing but like 90s and aughts bands Mm -hmm. And the spin doctors refused to acknowledge that they only had like 30 minutes. They just kept playing and it screwed up the whole show. So the third eye blind, third eye blind was supposed to be the closer of that show. Oh. And they only had 25 minutes to play instead of an hour. And everyone got really mad because the spin doctors played too long. So the Goo Goo Dolls were very on the money about stopping at 60 minutes, which I mean, they played every song you'd want them to play. Mm-hmm. They have a new album. They played one song off of it. Everything else was just like the single. Excellent. Singles. Yeah. Like it was nothing but the shit you'd want to hear them play. And then in the middle of the train set, they invited Johnny Resnick back out to play American Girl with them. They they play, they, they play the Tom Petty song, American Girl, yeah. which is corny that they did that. It's a great song. But when Johnny Resnick came out, he was in like a bathrobe and he had his hair done up in a towel and he was wearing sandals. Like he made it look <laughs> like he just came from the bathroom and they played American girl and they killed it. And it was really funny. Like did they play a toilet flushing sound effect they, as he walked out. They, they, they <laughs> but it was really fun. I had a really good time. The audience was whatever, but you know, it was a good show. Well worth the money. Glad I saw the Goo Goo Dolls. I'm running out of nineties bands to see. I, I want to see bare naked ladies. If they ever get back together with Steven page, but, uh, other than that, I've kind of run out of 90s bands to go back and see. Uh, oh, yeah. Now that you've seen the Spin Doctors. Third Eye Blind, Eve Third Six, Blind, Everclear, yeah. Sugar Ray, Lit. Uh, you haven't no seen Doubt. Smash Mouth, have you? No. 
How did you miss? Like, how are they not touring with all of those bands? Uh, they actually were going to for that summer fest thing that uh, Everclear and Sugar Ray put on a few right. years ago. Right, they're in constantly row. touring with Sugar Ray. They they much. were invited to come out with Smash Mouth, and for some reason they couldn't do it, so they got I think um, the Gin Blossoms to fill in for them. Mm-hmm. This is years ago, but I've seen all those bands now at least that twice. Almost <laughs> sounds like a Simpsons joke. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so they got the Gin Blossom to come in because yeah, Neil, you went to a cool concert recently. Oh, I did. Uh, yeah, my pal Alora. Uh, Limical online, as some of you know, (laughs) she uh, she didn't treat me. I paid for my own tickets, but it was at her urging. She said, Neil Ming, you got to go see Weird Al with me. Yeah. One more time before um, he dies. No, (laughs) but, you know, he's he might he might very well retire at some point. I can't imagine it because he's still as hardworking as ever. He's in really good shape. He's in great shape. He was doing his high kicks. He was. um singing every once in a while i think like weird al uses backing tracks right does he ever lip sync not really i think um maybe at white white and nerdy he does the thing where he'll sing every other verse and then either one of the backup singers or maybe a backup track does some of the vocals for him just because it's such a wordy song but he was uh d- doing like amazing vocal performance the whole shtick with this uh with this tour is that he's touring with a live orchestra yeah cool it was really cool. It, I will say they weren't as well utilized as I would have hoped because he also had the full band with him. And a lot of his songs are designed to sound pretty full without an orchestra. But they did pick the songs that were kind of um, bombastic and that uh, would uh, do well. They did, you know, like The Biggest Ball of Twine in Minnesota <laughs> and just would, like these kind of sprawling. Um, Jurassic Park was really great. I can oh, imagine. That's great. Yeah. What about uh, Albuquerque? No Albuquerque, no. Oh, too hard to compose that. that. I, I, well, that song is kind of more repetitive, I think. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, yeah, it was really cool. It was uh, just, you know, um, d- didn't have the greatest seats or anything. He was kind of far away, but he got a little bit close. He always comes out to the audience at one point during each show. And um, I got to see him. This is my f- third time seeing Weird Al. Yeah. First time was um, when I was like 12. It was a show that I found out that, you know, my wife Ming was also at. When she was a kid, I so love that. Oh. yeah, um, and, it's happened to a few people I know where they'll be in a relationship and then find out retroactively they were both at the same concert. Yeah, Joe Botch and Jess Almeida were both at an Eve Six show uh-huh. before they started dating in college. I've met multiple people who were at this Weird Al show. It's like Weird Al came yeah. to town and like everything stopped <laughs> back in 1999. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that was really cool. That was a lot of fun. Uh, how about you, Ryan? Well. Before I segue into my thing, oh, sure. you remember when you uh, you texted the group? Uh, mm-hmm. We have a group message going that we used to stay in touch when we're not all in the same room like we are now. Mm-hmm. And said, by the way, I'm seeing Weird Al tomorrow night. And I said, funny you mentioned that. My brother and his wife just <laughs> saw Weird Al. Like, oh, yeah, the same tour. They were up in New Hampshire the night before you saw them. Cool. Nice. Uh, I haven't been to a good show in quite some time, so I'm going to change gears down here. My media current is I recently finished completely finished the full run of hbo sex in the city really now, this is going outside of our regular wheelhouse uh i watched it because but by the end i want to know how the whole story ended out uh big's real name is john there I, this show is stupid and it just doesn't matter <laughs> it just doesn't matter yeah but what i found fascinating because i watched it as a background television show for so long was the use of technology See, it wasn't until season six that there's a whole episode about them learning what Google is Whoa. and how Google works. Well, cause like season six is actually, it's 2004. Yeah. And although like Google is prevalent for many people from the late 90s on, it's also, it's a, it's a talking point throughout the show. These aren't tech savvy people. Is it, it's, what's a Sarah Jessica Parker's name? Samantha? No, Samantha is the blonde. The other. Kim yeah. Cattrall. Okay. Yep. Uh, her name is Carrie. Yeah. Carrie, Samantha, Miranda, and Charlotte. And she's like yeah. a writer? She is a writer who somehow, the story makes no sense. Um, she has $40,000 worth of shoes and $700 in the bank. They, they, nothing adds up. She couldn't possibly afford this Manhattan apartment, which they literally make jokes about. Yeah. Uh, but yet seeing how her MacBook changes over time from the first season, like 1998, 1999. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Seeing how their use of cell, their understanding of cell phones and transitioning away from pay phones, seeing things like it's not okay to smoke indoors and you're the minority now. People don't want you to smoke here. Yeah. We're like, oh, are there children here? No, we just don't like that. It's gross. How long did it take you to watch the whole show? I, I, I really pushed the last like two weeks or so, give or take. Uh, but I'm going to say probably like March or April. So. I had no idea you were 
you were watching it. <laughs> it's fun to. It doesn't come up organically in no. conversation. You're not the water cooler going, "Hey, you guys watched Sex in the City last night." Remember the show that ended in 2004? That is not your demographic. Like, it's, yeah. real, it's real fun to marathon an old show like that for cultural literacy purposes. Because I, yeah, I went back and watched all of Friends, and it's not it, it, there's problems with Friends. But I had a really good time watching it, like just finding out, oh, my God, Hank Azaria is like a recurring character on this show and he's really good on it. Like, mm-hmm. did you notice? I know I brought this up before. I don't think it was on a podcast, but there was a couple of episodes, maybe just one where Carrie, I think it's Carrie, starts dating a fashion photographer named Max and he wears like a leather coat. Yes. Did you know? Who, did you notice who that was Not until afterwards? And Kevin, who is it? That's James McCaffrey, Max Payne. The guy who plays Max, a New York City photographer, plays Max Payne, a New York City police officer, yeah. detective. <laughs> it has made my day. Like when I found out that was like one of his few other bi- that's like his biggest role next to Max Payne is that he was on Sex in the City, which probably got made around the same time the game was being recorded and written. I don't know. I'm just a Max Payne guy, and I think it's really funny. But was it, was he in just the one episode? I don't yeah, know. he was one of the earlier seasons. He wasn't a long term relationship for Carrie. No. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, something fascinating about the this exists in a New York City that is a it is a fantasy. It is a work of fiction. It's plausible reality. I mean, there's no like aliens or nonsense. You know, <laughs> there's never like the gang goes to find Bigfoot, but that would be the best episode. <laughs> the point yes. is in the opening credits, while well, Carrie Bradshaw is hopping around New York City and uh, hilarity ensues, we see the Kleiser Building, we see the Brooklyn Bridge, and we see the twin towers of New York City. Now, the show runs through 2001 and 2002. Do they address it in universe? Because at the same time, the biggest show on HBO was The Sopranos. And The Sopranos had the Twin Towers in the opening credits as well. Sopranos took that shot out, just like Sex and the City did. But Sopranos acknowledged that that happened. That exists diegetically in their universe in light of the way that the the formation of Homeland Security and... Law enforcement would in New affect, York City. Would affect the mob underworld. Yeah, it apps, And it does. Totally. Uh, and, and because they're criminals, they kind of leap for joy of like, ooh, nobody cares about New Jersey criminal. <laughs> like, all, like, yeah, their their characters are racist and they're open about like, yes, as Italian-American criminals, yeah. we are no longer the FBI's priority. The FBI has got bigger fish to fry. Let's see how long it lasts. But Samantha doesn't like dump a guy on 9-11 or anything <laughs> no, like that? No. There's no like... I wonder, so they just don't talk about it? Nope. It does not exist in their universe. Weird. Is it that it never happened and the towers are still standing? Or is it that, oh, no, there were never towers? Oh, no, like I said, there are shots of the Twin Towers in the opening credits. Oh, so they leave it in. Uh, well, after 9-11 happened, they also, like, they also took it out of the opening credits. But it's never discussed? No. Okay. I'm, uh, but what I'm just wondering is, like, have they retconned the towers out of the series at that point? And the characters pretend... <laughs> They pretend 9-11 never happened and that there never were any towers. In Sex and the City, the terrorists won. <laughs> it's, it's like they won through time, almost. <laughs> Their memories of the towers are gone. Yeah. I don't know. It just, it just seems like weird to take, to take the actual towers out of the intro, but not address it whatsoever. It's funny because one of the, fir- the first episode after September 11th happened, the first episode to air after the attacks is... is um. Fleet Week or something. It's something like Fleet Week. It's uh, when all the sailors, when all the, are in sh- the, they, their response to defeating the terrorists is all four of them fuck sailors. <laughs> <laughs> the sailors win, and there's a thing at the end credits that's clearly like, you know, support our troops or America or something, or it ends on a shot that's clearly of the Manhattan skyline, but we acknowledge it's, they never come out and say 9 11 happened and now I can't get my Manolos. Like, it's not like that. Yeah. It's, yeah. But they do, it is interesting, they acknowledge, like, how do these characters win? How about they all fuck sailors? I, I got one more question for you Shoot. that I could totally just Google, but did you see Will Arnett on the show? Yes, I did. Okay, so that's the show that turned him into a comedy actor. Correct. Because he was trying to be serious and everyone kept laughing on set. Was he funny by accident? He's funny. Yeah, <laughs> he's very, he's funny. He's trying to be serious, right? And it's it's like when he was... Uh, when he was on Law and Order SVU, like ah, Detective Stabler, I see you've arrived. <laughs> like he's just he's funny. He can't, he can't help take it. I can't take a serious adult matter seriously because it's him. It's him. <laughs> oh, that's heartwarming. I, uh, was he ever on The Sopranos? <laughs> no, but okay. he he easily could have. Uh, by the way, Justin Thoreau was on a uh, for oh, a yeah. brief length. All these like hunky dudes that could have played Max Payne in the movie. <laughs> I have a one-track get, mind. With get the, off the Max Payne. <laughs> Jesus. Max Payne train. I got to look this up. I got to watch Will Arnett being like sexy on Sex and the City. 
Weird. All right. Well, that's media current. Mm -hmm. All right. Sound. So now we're moving into the reason we're here. And I'm, I'm like going a mile a minute. I got a large cold brew I drank an hour ago and I'm still like on fire from it. It'll be real great. We're here to discuss this um, 2019 Nickelodeon classic renaissance, uh, a Rocco's Modern Life movie and an Invader Zim movie were recently published to the Netflix viewing platform. Yes, oh, yes. For all Netflix to exclusives, but they are Nickelodeon productions. Yeah. Now, I, I'd argue, I mean, they are both movies, Rocco less so. Yeah, I actually got worried when I first saw Rocco pop up on Netflix and I saw it was only 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. I was a little disappointed in that I thought, oh no, is Zim going to be 45 minutes? Because Rocco could be 45 and I'd be fine with it. Yeah. But Zim, I'm, I'm way more partial to Invader Zim. Um, Zim was 70 minutes. And I think both movies, honestly, like the context of which they were made, like 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 the leashes they were given creatively to do whatever they wanted, the amount of time they took to make, the running time, the look of the movies, the people involved, perfect for both movies. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. In a weird way, Rocco almost feels certainly feels as long, if not maybe a little longer. I don't think I could take an hour of Rocco, you know? <laughs> yeah. And they both felt authentic. Like dead on, like they both looked great. They sounded great. All the they didn't have to like replace voice actors, to my knowledge, and there was no real compromise. I, I, I haven't read up on this. Do you get the feeling that um, Nickelodeon wanted to premiere these on cable, <laughs> or do you think they just? Why do you think these ended up on Netflix? I I thought I heard that um, when at least with Rocco they were produced. And Nickelodeon was so happy with it that they felt like it's not going to reach that many people if we just show it on Nickelodeon. We got to sell this. The target audience has moved on to Netflix and streaming yeah. services. So we already have a deal with Netflix. Let's just put it on Netflix. We'll promote it and people will watch it and talk about it. It might have even been a matter of like losing valuable airtime. Like, hey, leading up to the Friday night at 7.30 premiere. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we are still a children's program, even though this is pitched for men in their mid-30s who watch in the 90s. They're going to lose valuable airtime of going, hey, we clearly need to show some old Rocco yeah. episodes leading up to this or yeah. teach the children what, what Rocco the even Rocco is. is. That's a good point. That's a really good point. And yeah. all those episodes have, they need to sell super soakers and Nerf guns and slushies. But, like, uh, by the way, none of that's changed. I, I guess no. none of that. I mean, uh, they may have shown these on Nickelodeon. How the fuck would we know? It, you know? It, it's such a treat because like, I'm not trying to be Mr. Netflix here, but... Hulu has all the old Viacom stuff. You go on Hulu. I go. I actually went on it a week before uh, the Zim movie popped up to watch some Zim. We watch, Neil and I were watching some Invader Zim this afternoon. Yeah. We watched the Mega Doomer episode, and they're all there. So I'm so I was kind of surprised that Hulu didn't get these two movies. Yeah, that's true. But it's kind of for the best because if it was on Hulu, there'd be a bunch of annoying commercials. Yep. And it'd be the same commercial like eight times over the course of this movie. You, you know what I mean? Netflix commercial free. So it just we, it just lucked out. I'm just happy. Sure. Rocco's yeah. 40 minutes and shit. Rocco's a little over 40 minutes, and there would have been like eight commercial breaks. Yeah, all would have been the same it's, car commercial. <laughs> Netflix is just yeah. I mean, it, these, yeah. these movies may leave Netflix at some point. Actually, no. Didn't it say it was a Netflix production? At Net, the, well, at the start? so what Netflix does, and I actually through the experience of selling my documentary and talking to people, I've right. learned this that if Netflix wants a project. In 2019, they want it to be branded a Netflix exclusive. They're mm -hmm. really not interested in just temporary licenses anymore. So if they buy your thing, they want you to go in and like rebrand a little bit. They want the Netflix stamp yep. in the movie somewhere. So these aren't going anywhere. They're staying I, on Netflix. I don't. Right. We just watched Invader Zim, and I don't remember seeing that in there. No, I think I think it had it as. It well. says Netflix I original. Think start. I think so. Yeah. I, I hope they go. I hope they put it out on home well, video. I guarantee Rocco definitely does. Yeah. Yeah. I really want to get the Blu-ray of the Zim movie. Um, okay, let's talk about Rocco. Yes. Okay, do we need to like put in the segue sound effect real quick? We can just keep talking, but... Let's play um, Rocco yelling Spunky. Rocco's Modern Life. Spunky! Spunky! So, Rocco's Modern Life. Uh, what, what are your feelings on the original Nicktoon? You know, it was, I, it was never my absolute favorite, mm -hmm. but it was always one of my favorites. There, if, if Rugrats was on, I might change the channel. If Wild Thornberries was on, eh, I turn it on the background while I read a book. <laughs> uh, Rocco? I loved Rocco. Rocco I really yeah. loved Rocco. Rocco aired, I think, a year, maybe less than a year after the original premiere of the three Nicktoons, which was Doug, Ren and, Ren, Doug, Ren and Stimpy, and Rugrats. Hot damn. Um, and to, as far as I can remember, they may as well have all been a package because Rocco was 
one of the four, you know? I remember Rocco being the new show. I yeah. Was, we were all we were born in 86, 87, and I do remember the promotional materials for Rocco. I distinctly remember the first time I saw a teaser for Rocco that mm-hmm. was like, who's Rocco? So you were aware, like, oh, there's, a, there's another new There's a new kid in town. Yeah. And I believe Rocco, like the other shows, the big hook of it was production wise that it was made domestically. Like that was like a big thing with Rocco. And you can kind of tell it's a completely American made as far as I know. There hmm. wasn't a lot of international fingerprints on it. And I don't I mean, I don't remember that fact being pointed out as children. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we actually got Ian T. McFarlane wrote in. He's one of our patrons over at guaranteedvideo.com. And if you join, you back for even a dollar a month. You can ask questions for our podcast. And Ian actually asked, what were your favorite Nick tunes? So maybe we should all go, you know, Rocco, is it safe to say Rocco was none of our favorite shows? None of our, it was no one's favorite at this table. Always number one. Right. We'll talk about why, but yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, it's a top, probably a top four for me, which means it's number four. I mean, we all, Ren and Stimpy, right? Ren and Stimpy, probably most lasting impact. Ren and Stimpy. Ren and Stimpy. Followed by. My number two is honestly Rocco. Okay, okay. And then and then all real monsters. Yeah. Ooh. Um yeah, it's kind of hard to say. Doug has weirdly stuck with me the longest. Doug grew on me yeah. hard. I went my sister actually bought me the entire Nickelodeon run of Doug on DVD as Doug's, a stocking stuff. Doug's my solid four, absolutely. Doug's, but I, yeah, but I'm not gonna necessarily laugh out loud at something that was intentionally a joke on Doug. As a kid, it wasn't funny either. It's more that I just love the world of Doug and talking about it with you guys. Yeah. Rocco, I have a ton of respect for now. Looking back, um, I don't know if it was a case of trying to one up the um like the level of creative control and like the fully realized, you know, aesthetic of, of, of Ren and Stimpy and oh, really all those original Nicktoons and animation at that time in general. This was the same year as Batman the Animated Series coming out. Like prestige projects. Presti- for- yeah, prestige projects that were uh not following any uh pre, you know, pre-established style of cartoons. Yeah, the, all the Nicktoons have their own aesthetic. They're not, qu- I mean, yeah, there's some Hanna Barbera and John K stuff and Ren and Stimpy, but, and yes, there's gross out humor in Ren and Stimpy and in Rocco, but Rocco stands on its own two feet. It really Rocco, does. Yeah, Rocco is straight out of a Trapper Keeper or a notebook or something. Jo- yeah. Joe Murray, the creator of it, if you look at his older, his previous work, it's like the style is clearly, you know. It, it's jazz pattern in the cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, um, talking about like like the, the, the like that like cyan blue and like the magenta red on the cups. The, you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, yep. Yeah. The, the colors and the shapes on the show are just so good. It's it's really the hook of the show. Is It's just like an amazing looking show. It, just, it reminds me of all these other ingredients from my favorite Nickelodeon shows. Mm-hmm. Like, the, you know, I'm um, on Pete and Pete, the, the, uh, the house brand, the Acme of Pete and Pete was Krebstar. Right, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Rocco has its own conglomo, conglomo yeah. or anything, the blank O blank or blank O Matic O town, things like that. All the DNA of Rocco feels to me like, I won't say borrowed, but it reminds me of the satellite Nickelodeon uh, uh, IP. And there's definitely some Ren and Stippy to it. I what, Looking back at it now, and this goes for the new movie with Rocco, mm-hmm. I do feel like the ick factor, like the booger factor, the fart factor <laughs> of sure. Rocco's modern life still to me feels a little forced. And even as a kid, it didn't feel as organic and I can't quite yeah. put my finger on it. I don't think it was like an executive order. I mean, what, what's the, they made that show camp Laszlo. Yep. Right. Right. I've never watched that. Have you? No. I've seen it in the passing, but they do not do. I mean, the world changed. Like it's they, not they a don't, show. the gross out humor of cartoons is simply not there now. Well, I think, uh, and it wasn't then because camp Laszlo is also now an old show. The humor of Rocco is it's, it's very unserious satire. Yeah. It's Mo- Rocco's modern life. Yeah. So the original show was often just kind of taking aim at something that was kind of like an, a 90s issue or just some social thing or like recycling. Product. Or, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff like that. Um, and But it was always just kind of like very like uh, charmingly ham-fisted, you know, just like n- not a like not a serious commentary in any way, just a goofy cartoon that's kind of making fun of yeah, stuff. Yeah, in, in order of levity... Versus like sincerity, you got like King of the Hill, mm-hmm. right? Then you get like The Simpsons, yeah, and then you get Rocco, yeah. You know what I mean? This new movie is exploring that a little bit more, sure. Uh, but it's like totally in keeping with what the show was always doing, um, which is just kind of mentioning things and exploring them in a uh, observational comedy kind of way, yeah. and just doing it in a ridiculous fashion. Uh, that doesn't work out well for the, for, for Rocco for the most part. Yeah, for a fast-paced forty-plus minute project, 
uh, like, all right, let's have the, let's make fun of the iPhone. Let's make fun of there's a Starbucks every corner. Let's make fun of you know another thing of that you know the the drones. They go through these quickly, but it doesn't feel rushed. Mm-hmm. It's like let's just knock these out. Like we don't need a whole episode about the iTunes Store. If we were bringing the show back, if this is a whole new season, it would be too much. When I first saw the promos for the Rocco movie, <clears throat> I like a lot of people on Twitter were a little cautious because it was like, oh. Is this just going to be dumping on modern tech? Is this just going to be, oh, aren't iPhone stupid? Isn't it's Facebook stupid? It's going to be when stupid? they brought Futurama back and like, oh, hey, man. the Hypnotoad is on the iPhone. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the Futurama stuff when it came back after a certain point just felt like bitter old guys like yep. yelling at a cloud, right? <laughs> and uh, with Rocco, <laughs> hearing you say that, Neil, sort of explains it right. away in a good way because – when I watched the Rocco movie, I watched it on my own the other night. It's just called the Rocco movie. It's called Static, static Cling. The Static Cling. Um, the first like 20 minutes, which is to say half of it, mm-hmm. is all either fan service or dumping on modernity, dumping on 2019. In a Rocco way. In a Rocco way. And at a certain point, I, I, I it never got annoying to me, but I was like, oh man, am I really just liking this because, oh hey, I remember the big heads. Yeah. <laughs> oh hey, I remember really, really big man. Oh hey, I remember... The and, gluton joke of the guy who's like sort of a uh, Cenobite, but you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like heck. Yeah. yeah, there was all of that going on. Like just fan service, fan service, fan service. And again, that that's why it's good that it's only 40 minutes and change. Not yeah. a, like there's a whole new season. Like, no, that's too much. But the movie becomes about that. That yep. becomes yeah. the point of the movie is that Rocco feels uncomfortable in the new world in that he wants to find one thing he can hold on to. Yes. He really is like, a grown up fanboy, and that's kind of cool. And yeah, it, it's, it's like it's it's a little uh, for my personal taste, it was a little too meta a few times. Well, it's like it's that, but it's well, a, when Rocco does meta, they've done it before in a couple episodes. Yeah, it's always very clearly, it's not like, oh, did you did you notice that this is about the show? <laughs> it's always so clearly about making cartoons or about nostalgia. Rocco, this cartoon from the 90s will not fix your problems. Yes. <laughs> I know, Mr. Bighead, that's, but I don't you, care. They're not putting it past anyone. You use use the word, Neil, uh, respect to describe your sentiments towards Rocco. Yeah. And that's totally, by the end of the Static Cling, I felt nothing but respect for what they did. Yeah. I, I like it. I might not watch it again for a long time, um, but it really was like, hey, you want like a shot in the arm of all the stuff you liked about Rocco? Well, here it is. Boom. And it's a good story. It is. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to say. Like, it's a great example of cartoon. I, I do think it's a gorgeous show. Um, the colors and the designs. Uh, the movie all, didn't lose any of it either. No, it's nope. it's all good. They they it's it's cell animated too. Still got the B fifty twos. Wait, mm-hmm. bullshit. What do you mean? It's cell animation. Does that uh, forgive me? Does that mean it was animated like? Could it have been animated in a flash-like program, frame by frame? Uh, there, there, uh, there was probably post-production that involved computers. Maybe the coloring was like digital colors. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that, but I do know that it was they used cell animated. Wow. Uh, yeah. Bravo. Yeah, really good. <laughs> and they, uh, they actually, um, they like emphasize it when it goes to the cartoon within the cartoon, the fat heads. Oh yeah. Uh, the crappy they, CG. <laughs> well, oh, no, not not even that. But like when they show the the 2d fat heads cartoons. Yeah. You notice how they kind of like add a shadow under the cell. Yeah. Like old Simpsons. Like, oh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I loved that. Um, that was a really nice, like pretty subtle touch, but, uh, and if you, if you look closely, like the, um, there's like more sketchiness to the, uh, the, the cartoon within the cartoon there. Sure. sure. I picked up on that a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, really fun to go through and look through. Yeah. There is also, as you mentioned, there is bad CGI. There's like a little bit of mixed media in the this. chameleon twins. Yeah. Where yeah. They're just, God, it's I the most about like those Bill Watterson they get of just like, we have computers. Yeah. Computers. Yeah. <laughs> are, I'd never thought of it. Got so many parallels between, those bizarre, I know they're a reference to something else, but those bizarre twins who can teleport in and out with the accents from Super Jail, very <laughs> different show, and go like, oh yeah, there were those ridiculous of ambiguous origin, a nation of ambiguous origin twins who were always a malevolent force in Rocco's life. They like, they, it's not that they actively disliked him. Big Head dislikes him. Yes. They just don't care about Rocco. I love that Big Head always disliked Rocco, but did he ever pick up on the fact that Bev wanted Rocco? I'd have to. I want to go back and rewatch. There's one. I mean, there's one episode where they come face to face with it, and and Bev tries to seduce Rocco. Right? Yes, and it got they're pulled. breaking the plates. Oh, that got pulled. It got, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I'm they sure uh, flew too close to now, the sun with but, that one. Um, that's one that always stuck out to me. Um, that poor wallaby. And <laughs> uh, Ed Bighead is so good. 
He's I, probably my favorite character. I at first thought, it's how odd is it that Mr. Bighead's reintroduction is a song? Yeah. A song. And to go, well, it's not the very first time we see him. I mean, he, after he accidentally causes an economic I love collapse. It. I love the song. It's yeah. really cute. And I just like Marvel. I mean, like Bev is almost the same design and she's a great character too. But uh, like, if you told me that Ed Bighead were, was like the original main character of Rocco that Joe Murray pitched yeah. and they're like, no, just make that guy like kind of the villain or something. Like you need someone cuter. I'd buy that because he's such a, like he, that. I feel like he's got to be like everyone's favorite to draw probably. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. Cause he's easy as hell. Well, he's easy as hell, but he's so cute. <laughs> he's and, like, like three lines. And like his, the way his mouth works is just like, I, get, so I don't want to jump the gun to Zim, but I just love the tallest have so many reasons, honest, legitimate reasons to hate Zim. Yeah. They want him out of the... They've been so happy that for a long time, Zim has been out of their life, and everything good in Mr. Big Head's life is ruined the moment Rocco returns. <laughs> what? Yeah. Are, so, I guess I... The first thing I heard about this Rocco movie when it actually hit was mm-hmm. spoiled by social media, because... Social media platforms are designed to figure out what you want to hear and yeah. put it in front of your face, which I've complained about for like two years on this podcast now. Yeah. <laughs> but um, everyone heard about uh, 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 what the big head's kid name. What was it? Ralph? Ralph became Rachel. Yeah. Ralph yes. is Rachel. Yeah. And that got spoiled for me like 10 minutes before I watched the movie. And I really wish I didn't know. Uh, hopefully by now you've heard of this. <laughs> well, yeah, it didn't exactly get spoiled. I mean, I, I willingly clicked on the link and, and got spoiled. The, the article was um, Joe Murray worked with Glad for a transgender character. Well, that I'm fine with that yeah. article, but there was literally like just video clips on Twitter oh, like, yeah. being recommended to me. That was like just 20 seconds of him coming out of the ice cream truck as a she. Yeah. And, and like that was like that was the moment it got revealed to the audience what was going on. And like I can't. I, I should just not watch the clip, I guess, but I, I couldn't really tell what I was seeing. But it was a tweet that went around the world. Like there was, yeah, when it was yeah. when it was yeah. spoiled for me, because it, yeah, it's spoiling. That's what we, let's call him like we see him. Yeah. When it was spoiled for me, it's not there is a transgender storyline within the new Rocco because clearly within this universe, these are wonderful, loving people, and they are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's I suppose. <laughs> ra- it's Ralph Bighead becomes Rachel. Like oh that okay, I get like it ain't Filbert. So but yeah, it just it just spoiled it for it told me. Well, Who, I don't know what context. I, guess, I, I think yeah. it's kind of the point is like it's not supposed to be that big of a spoiler. Like it's one more thing for Ed Bighead to have difficulty. But it with, is it but, is the finale of the movie. Uh, yeah, I yeah, I guess so. But I get the sense that they kind of wanted to like, you know, this is another example of how culture has changed. Oh sure, no, I like and that about the movie itself. Yeah, and that's yeah. it. But like that's it doesn't need to get it, and it, it does get woven into the storyline to a degree. Yeah. Um, I have an interesting point here sure. I'm going to make because also because I have more on Rocco than Zim and there's plenty to dissect. Di- di- yeah, yeah, I'm going to yeah. yeah move the chess pieces for Zim when it comes Zim time. Yeah, uh, my talk. I watched the movie three. I watched Rocco three times already. Holy hell. Uh, yeah. Now, in my defense, Zim came out less than 48 hours ago. Yeah. But I, and I've already watched that twice. I've already but, watched Zim twice. <laughs> uh, uh, after watching it, and I rewatched it with my brother. My brother brought my brother Sean brought up a really interesting point. He said. Like, how did you feel about the scene where Ralph reveals, like, by the way, now I'm Rachel and I'm happy now? And I went, oh, that was so tasteful and it's it's great. This is clearly designed. They could show this for kids and it would still work. Kids watch Steven Universe. They understand these things. Yeah. They're not stupid. <laughs> uh, in this, But this is not for children. It's for men in their mid-30s, mostly men in their mm-hmm. mid-30s who grew up with Rocco. Yeah. And he said... Yeah, but wouldn't it have been funnier if Filbert says great, Hever says great, and Rocco says, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I just want my, like, hey, that's great. I just want my oh, show back. Fish yeah. <laughs> and then it go like, yeah, the gender of the artist is irrelevant. I just want my show. If, if, if I was writing, if I was in the writing staff, I would have pitched that joke. Yeah. <laughs> and when goes, my brother yeah, pitched, yeah. I was like, that is that's yeah. way funnier. But. But no, it is a, no, it, it is it's, a sweet it's, moment. It's, it's great that, uh, yeah, like the main characters. Aren't phased really. No, nope. it's, it's like the and best moment in the whole thing. Let's be it, honest. That's why, like, I wish it wasn't spoiled. And I'm, I'm just, yeah. I'm just like kind of pointing the finger at social media for like, God damn it! I feel like I got punished for not immediately watching it. So when the Zim movie came out, I literally went directly from work that day at four o'clock. I didn't go home. I went right to a friend's place, and we were like, just put it on. I haven't looked at my phone all day. I don't want anything spoiled. And there were art things in the Zim movie that could have been spoiled for me. Yeah. Totally. Gifts or frame grabs, like anything. If, I, I'll if get off of it. I just I just wish I didn't know. I wish sure, I, yeah, 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 yeah. If they had made the joke 
of I just I just want my which makes sense within this context. <laughs> I just want my cartoon from the nineties. The response wouldn't have been, oh, they had a transgender character. They had a transgender storyline that's respectful and you know and loving. It would have been, does is Rocco transphobic? Like, yeah. oh, it's very no. smart to sidestep it. Of course it. not. But in my head canon, I'm gonna always remember that joke. Now that the, yeah. the, 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 that, it, that is a really funny. Like, is Rocco, Rocco gonna be? So like, Rocco totally does like get hyper focused on the cartoon. Yeah, which is weird. I mean, Rocco sometimes was like that on the show. Like they'd they'd give him those kind of anxieties and obsessions. More of a heifer times. thing though, or Filbert it, thing. It really was. Yeah, it, it I yeah, I kind of felt like the character of Rocco himself was the the most odd and off. They had to make it. I mean, they only had forty five minutes. Yeah. So what are they going to do? Like if they write in something about Melba again and like right, have Filbert yeah. be the one that wants the show back? Like yeah. Rocco was always kind of the best when he was just uh, innocently being. Sub, he was more subdued. By, yeah, but you're right. They had he had, he had to do a lot and react to a lot. He's yeah. a little more manic in this. Mm-hmm. Not a lot. Not a lot of Spunky in the movie. No, <laughs> that's fine. I, lo- I love Spunky. <laughs> Me too. Uh, well, my- you, well, you get the great subplot of Spunky. Um, Getting obsessed with mops and ordering mops. That was so, really yeah. funny. <laughs> that was Sicko. really good. <laughs> yeah. like the, the Amazon guy is like, I know what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. My, <laughs> my biggest criticism of the movie, and they, you know what? It's, and they, they don't a hundred percent avoid this. It's not a total vacuum. Yeah. But man, I, I love Heifer's family, and we got to see the ghost of Grandpa. Oh my god! But yeah. there's so. Oh man, I love those characters yeah, you're right, so the much. Mom and Dad aren't really there. Uh, nope. Or his, yeah. Uh, shitty siblings. When they dealt with like, even, even back in the nineties, when they dealt with gender roles at a PG level where it was, you know, the butt of a joke again, it's 30, it's 20 plus years later. Uh, it was still, they weren't mean spirited. It was this goofy. It was like Monty Python level. Oh, a dress is funny. Yeah. I mean, again, the society is, society's changed. This is a yeah. cartoon from a cartoon for children yeah. from decades ago. And they handled it wonderfully. But God, I mean, I'm glad that Grandpa's a ghost and he still calls Rocco a beaver. Yeah. But man, I love his, <laughs> like, Heifer's dad, who's like, he's just walking into his next heart attack. He's like just <laughs> oh chomping, God, yeah. like... Yeah. It makes me think of that line that Apu had when Homer has his heart attack of perhaps I'm in some way responsible for Mr. Simpson and go like, hey, guy, a guy walks up the counter. Can I get some beef jerky? And he goes, would you like some vodka with that? And he goes, yeah, what the hell? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the I am very glad that Philbert, one, Philbert and his wife just immediately like, by the way, I'm back with my wife. Hi, Rocco. Like, <laughs> Yeah, Doesn't also matter. they just throw him like re- reuniting with his children is just kind of there at the end. It wasn't the first thing he did. Yeah, <laughs> no, that was right. good. That was good. Yeah. I, I, so I went back and looked at the final episode of the Rocco show that aired. That's when he has the kids with Hutchinson. No, right? it was the final segment was about how everyone was claiming that their ancestors founded O Town. Oh. And there was like an argument over who was like naturalized or who was like really owed the land of O Town. Yeah. Rocco, Heifer, Filbert, do not get thrown into space. <laughs> yeah, thank you, because I that's not how the show left. It was, I mean, like, no one was going to call them out on that, I guess. It was a funny way to start it. Yeah. And, like, have really, really big men, like, bring you up to speed about what was going on. It yeah. just, it didn't really, there's nothing to explain with Rocco. It's like, it's a cartoon. Rocco is the most, like, cartoon-ass cartoon this side of Red and Stimpy. Yeah. By the way, I enjoy... But- Really, really big man. It's a funny joke. The nipples are funny. It's something. It's not quite S- sexual, powers but so it's stupid. it's just still. Powder Toast Man does it better. Oh, and yeah. he did it first. Yes. Powder, for those of you listening at home yeah. or unfamiliar, Powder Toast Man is a caricature of superhero, a cartoon of superheroes from Ren and Stimpy. A marketing but boy. Yeah. A point in Rocco's favor. You can watch it without feeling bad. Yeah, <laughs> you really can. Um, so we all liked Rocco. Yep. Ryan, you really liked it. You were like really. I, I, yeah, again, I, I liked Rocco a lot. And I remember uh, when I was just about too old for cartoon, but I, that clearly never happened because here we are. Here still we are. It. <laughs> like, I got it. Ooh, I got ex- Although I got more excited for Zim, I really do love Rocco. Rocco is a, a place in my heart. But when I was uh, at an age when I really should have been watching less cartoons, but didn't stop. Yeah. Cat Dog has so many of the same sentiments, the same type of vibe, the same like in universe. But Cat Dog is so mean spirited. They're they're always the victims. People just beat them up because basically because they have a disability. Yeah. It's like they <laughs> deserve. But that's that. kind of the weird. Yeah. Cat dog like yeah. the, the, everyone in this universe hates them. It's like it's not even like they're mean or bitchy. I mean, cat's kind of bitchy, but dog is a wonderful guy. He's a goof. He's like it's Pinky in the Brain. He's a silly dumb one. Everything that like didn't quite work about Rocco, where it's just kind of like, what are you going for here? 
uh, like that times ten with cat dog. It's it, just no, like no, yeah, I there's no humor to grab on. Not to throw the show. Nicktoons brain trust from the '90s under the bus here. Yeah, but you really get the feeling, and this that like there was like they had like this. Imagine the, the visual metaphor I'm going for here is they have a great photograph of Ren and Stimpy. It's like, oh man, Ren and Stimpy, we nailed it. Okay, put on the photocopier, make another one. So they get a photocopy. Okay, here's like Rocco. Okay, we need another one. They take that photocopy, that's Rocco. Put it on the photocopier, copy it. Okay, now here's like uh, Ah Real Monsters. Then again, here's Cat Dog. Cat Dog was one too far. Like Cat Dog yeah. was just one <laughs> I was too gonna, many generation losses. <laughs> I was going to use the analogy of what washes off in the in a load of laundry, but yours works better, actually. Yeah, yeah like, cat, like Cat Dog, like I just, even as a kid, no, actually I missed a step with Angry Beavers. Angry Beavers would have been in there somewhere. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I like Angry Beavers. Um, Me too. But like, Cat dog is just, it just, just doesn't pass the bar. And I agree. It's like, it's just oddly mean and a little too stupid to be mean. Like, how about in this episode, they just get beat up for being different. Like what, what do they learn? What are the kids like? Yeah. Oh, it's funny. Like, I don't No, yeah. it's not. What are you doing? Here? Yeah. There's not a lot of like memorable silhouettes on that show. And the music's kind of weird. And hey, why do they live far away from everyone else? Like, cause everyone tries to hurt them. Yeah. Like, and like, just, what do they do wrong? And you can make the main characters, the losers on a show like that, like Beavis Rocco. and Budhead yeah. or You're Rocco, Rocco. Yep. or, um, Ed, Ed and Eddie, but half the time in our real monsters. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you know, you kind of have to have them and not just win every now and then, but you have to kind of have a reason they're the losers. Like an Ed, Ed and Eddie, they are kind of a malicious force because of Ed's schemes. Yeah. Or Eddie's scheme. Which one's? I never was a fan of that show. The jerk. The jerk right, of the three. Yeah. The um, one who's clearly the leader. Yeah, yeah, the leader. I believe it's just standard Ed. Kind of getting off course here with yeah. Cat Dog. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Rock- they're not bringing Cat Dog back. Don't worry. Oh, my God. I don't know about that. You may live to eat those words. We're recording. <laughs> so they put out a Nicktoons kart racing game in the last yeah. couple of months, right? And it came out, and the roster was so weird. It was so weird because it had, like, Helga and Arnold – I think Tommy and Angelica and Reptar. The point of this is that nothing from Ren and Snippy made it into it, but the Ninja Turtles did because Nickelodeon, I think now, they now owns the new Ninja Turtles. Yep. But it's just so weird because it was hanging its hat so heavily on the '90s stuff, and there was only like ten or eleven characters, something like that, in this game for a kart racer. That's nothing. Like for a fighting, because they got DLC. Well, it's and they I, will. I honestly think what happened was Ren and Stimpy was going to be like a at least two characters, if not four, like they probably would have had like powdered toast man in it, you know, money, mud skipper, the horse, yeah, the something. horse, like there would have, they probably would have had three or four. This is just my head cannon theory. And then all the news came out about John K. Yeah, that's plausible. Yeah. And I think they were like, shit, we got to pull the plug on the yeah. Ren and Stimpy stuff, but we got to get this game out. And the game, uh, SpongeBob was in it too. I think I just, ima- forgive yeah. me. I just imagined like an onion article. That's, you know, a new racer for Nickelodeon, Nicktoons, 47 playable characters. 45 of them are from Doug. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah there's no just, Doug. Just, oh, just, wow. Chalky yeah. Studebaker's in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah he's Disney for a now. car racing game. I love it. I feel like Nickelodeon and Viacom are in a really weird position with Ren and Stimpy right now, where if you're going to bring back the Nicktoons, Ren and Stimpy has to be there. They always seemed a little embarrassed by Ren and Stimpy, though. But they were so popular. They were, but like I don't know. I feel like whenever they do, they would do the, uh, like the the mashup kind of kind of thing. The cartoon they, all they, stars. Yeah, the cartoon all stars where they'd have some image or something commemorating Rugrats something. Was the yeah, thing. Rugrats would be in the foreground, and Ren and Stimpy would kind of be pushed off to the side. Like, oh yeah, and those weirdos. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like, but um, Zim I'm was sort that. of Zim. I mean, this when is a horrible Zim, segue. Yeah. But good. Zim came out right around the same time as SpongeBob, right? Was it 99 or 2000? Or? Circa 99. It was around like Futurama. Like, it, yeah. I, I had kind of, because of shit like Cat Dog, I just stopped watching Nickelodeon. And yep. in junior high, my friend Joe Botch started pushing me on, like, oh man, like, uh, you got to check out this Zim show. And uh, it wasn't until like ninth grade that I got together with him and he showed me Invader Zim. And I saw the Poop Dog episode, Door to Door, which might be my favorite episode of Zim. It's the one where they have to sell candy bars. And I I, uh, I adored it, and I've been a fan ever since. And the reason I bring up SpongeBob in the same breath is that I resented SpongeBob because Zim got canceled kind of quickly, mm-hmm. Family Guy style. And Zim never got brought back like Family Guy. And SpongeBob is still kind of a thing to this day. Yeah. SpongeBob the Musical just like won Tony Awards. Like the mo- there was huge. another movie that just came out, right? Yes. When Steven Hellenberg died, like the outpouring it. of just like, yeah. insane, just like amazing. I don't know. Just like the, uh, 
everyone kind of took a step back and like looked at like the cultural pillar that SpongeBob, SpongeBob became. Was. Yeah, SpongeBob was great. And but at the time when I was like 15 or whatever, I it resented it because I, I felt like it buried Zim. I'm like, really? Sure. This yeah. show got a free ride. So I kept putting. And I, up, could, I could see how like feeling like SpongeBob was kind of a retread of Rocco and, and Ren and Stimpy in a way. I mean, it's definitely on the shoulders of them. Yeah. But it's a great show. No. And, yeah. And I've gone back and I've. I, I eventually looked at SpongeBob when I was probably like 19 or 20. Mm-hmm. And that's when I was like, okay, no, this is great. Yeah. But Zim, I, I always like kind of held a candle for. What, what was your early experience with Zim? I definitely watched it. I was really excited to watch it. I remember loving it. But um, yeah, it was kind of a lightning in a bottle kind of thing. It was over pretty quickly. And I always kind of relegated it to that kind of circa MySpace era. Like, you think of it as that and not Nicktoon? Yeah, yeah, it was definitely something. It was a hot topic product, and that kind of made me afraid to return to it. So I haven't. I haven't watched any episodes until today, basically. And I, my assumption was that it would not hold up. That the jokes would be only funny to an eleven-year-old, and that the aesthetic would just be like so dripping with that hot topic era that it just like plaid would, miniskirt that like, it just wouldn't yeah. work anymore. Yep. What about you, Ryan? I remember. When I think of when I think of Invader Zim, I think of being in high school, working at the Sears at the Kingston Mall, and seeing just inundated with Zim and Invader Zim merchandise and and stickers and shirts and plushies at Hot Topic, and, go, and thinking this show has been off the air for a while. Is this going to be the new Nightmare Before Christmas? Because That's it's true, a, yeah. a lot of crossover in that demographic. And the answer is yes. Yeah, yes. They, they made Zim merch for a long time. They're still making it. Now, now they're going to be pumping it. I have I've gone back a few times and mm-hmm. just I, I want to say I'm I'm 32 now. Yeah, and I want to say I've had two renaissances with Yonan Vasquez as a creator or Jonan. I always call him Yonan. <laughs> um, I should know this by now. Uh, yeah, me too. But I, just Vasquez. I've always yeah. Everybody gets. I, it. I collected all the Johnny the Homicidal Maniac comic books. Devi, Squee. I loved all of his comics. I still have them. Mm-hmm. And I want to say like every six seven years, I've just like gone back and just like gone through all of his stuff in like a weekend. And it is pretty immature. You know, he really blew up. Vasquez really blew up when he was eighteen or nineteen. I think he got. I think Viacom gave him the Zim opportunity when he was 19 i think that's how old he was yeah yeah can you fucking imagine being 19 and nickelodeon viacom comes to you and goes here's a dumb truck of money make us something it would be a disaster yeah (laughs) but it wasn't because they had the the right people came on to zim like vasquez is incredibly funny yeah and zim i think a lot of this a lot of the stuff i say in the show really is just like my own fan theory that I'm crafting and it shouldn't be taken as gospel. But when I've listened to commentary tracks for Zim and read up on the making of that show, it does feel like Vasquez got, I had like 10 or 12 stories he really wanted to do. And then he just got tired of like the work behind the scenes. There are a lot of, there are a lot of stories about him burning out on writing scripts and uh, other directors, other writers having to really tell him like, no, you can't just write nihilism. Like, you can't just be a cynical creative for a children's TV show. You, you have need to, something to, to hold on to, like a plot line. Yeah, that we resolve. need yeah. plots. It's, I'm not saying it has to be an optimistic show. It just needs to have a structure. Yeah. And um, Steve Russell, who directed most episodes of Zim, you can find he wasn't brought on to the DVD commentaries for some reason. And I don't know if Steve Russell had a feud with Vasquez or whatever. He has also said out loud publicly he just doesn't want to work on Zim ever again. It was too hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he, on the commentaries he has recorded that have been published independently to YouTube, has, I wouldn't say just thrown Vasquez under the bus, but he has brought up, oh, I had to like tell Yonan to like try harder and to like like rewrite a script and things like that. And uh, Vasquez actually didn't direct that many episodes of Zim. Yeah. He was a great creative director. It looks, it's clearly his stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Did you either of you ever read Vasquez's comics when you were younger? No, I never really got into it. I've read Johnny the Homicidal Maniac, but I mean, well over a decade ago, I, they didn't they didn't really resonate for me. Yeah, Zim definitely did. Oh, I, Zim, yeah. I always loved the energy of Zim. I, I I love his aesthetic. Yeah, uh, I would be happy to see another project he does, Vasquez. I mean, but um, yeah, Zim definitely did it for me way more than uh, Johnny. Vasquez apparently has been struggling to sell new pitches to uh-huh. various networks and players. Um, and I think a lot of that is because his work ethic got out that he was just just irresponsible, I think is the politest word for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, like a lot of people are like that. Like Dan Harmon is infamously like like lazy. Like he'll fall asleep yeah. in writer's rooms on the couch and things like that. So, yeah, but so like, but, but, with, with all that in context, yeah. 
But the, the reason, the reason I was sure, sure, sure. close beat. So what ended up happening recently was Nickelodeon and him had a discussion. Nickelodeon really wanted Zim to come back because, like Ryan said, the merch yeah. <laughs> moved dump trucks. Of uh, How much Zim crap was selling, even 10 years ago, would have been is ridiculous to imagine Zim stuff selling, and it was. A mm-hmm. decade ago would have been like seven or eight years after Zim was on air for the brief fart in time it was on air, right? Yeah. But um, Nickelodeon hired Vasquez to make this short Ninja Turtles film about Raphael and Donatello having a fight. It's like five, ten minutes, I think. You can watch it on YouTube, and it's in the Vasquez style, but it's Ninja Turtles, which is cool. And I think that went so well for them. They were like, okay, let's make the Zim movie. You're ready to do this without Steve Russell. You can handle this now. Yeah. You, you've matured as a creator. But as a, as a viewer, like all that like context about Vasquez and just like the amount of time he's kind of been out of the game in animation. Yeah. We go into this movie with some trepidation because he is the director. It really set a low bar, which probably amplifies yeah. how much I loved it. I really liked the movie. That's the that's the surprise here. This movie's fucking great. It's fantastic. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh I just God. watched it. All right. So I'm like really riding high because we literally just watched it right before recording. I am this. overstimulated. This is my <laughs> first like re-exposure to Invader Zim since I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, and I wasn't expecting it to be so watchable or something that I would still find funny as a, an adult now. Yeah. Um, but no, my God, it has like such a, such an attitude towards it. Just, just, uh, there's no real rules, but it must be following some sort of protocol because it just works. It never really feels it. It never feels like it's gone off the the, the rails or like it's just dragging on. You know, it's oh good, no, you know, it's a good comparison to make. We've talked about this uh, Lego Batman movie. We all oh, like the yeah, Lego yeah, Batman yeah. movie. Too long and too uh, asinine. I don't know. <laughs> it's too sugar high. At a certain point, you're like, okay, I get it. God, it's just so glitterily and fast, glittery and, and fast. And yeah, it's got that childlike energy to it. Yeah. And like, it just also gets, involves a giant wormhole. Now that you mention yeah. <laughs> it, it, it just gets too like by, by, by an hour in in Batman, you just want to look at the floor and take a breather between your legs. You're and like, I did, I, I did have that moment a little bit with Invader Zim yeah. uh, towards the middle, just because it's so relentless joke, 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 background joke, the like timing all is the so time. Good. Like, the, to- the timing is good. Um, and like you, like you said during, while we were watching, a lot of the timing is samey. Like they'll do the same quiet character screams, character screams that says something quiet. There's like only so many permutations of that. But the ingredients are always different. Mm -hmm. It's like making chocolate chip cookies or a pizza, right? Like, yeah. Um, I will say, uh, my biggest criticism of the movie, which I I really enjoyed, but it's not even criticism per se. If anything, it's maybe even a tip of the hat of like, good for you. Good for them was I their Edna Krabappel moment where I thought, who is my favorite character? Just like I said with uh, oh, Heifer's family, the actress who portrayed Miss Bitters... Miss Bitters. Lu- ...was named Lucille Bliss. I, I looked her up. Yeah. She passed away in 2012. That was the one thing kind of missing from the movie. It's like the only... The school. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So much school. of it was... Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Was Dib and Zim and Gaz in school, and knowing like, all right, this woman who has a, an amazing career, um, yeah, look her up, Lucille Bliss, and yeah, she was almost a hundred. She was born in 1916, but she passed away at 96. Wow, oh, which meant she was doing, yeah, if she she was doing Miss Bitter's voice like into her 80s and into <laughs> her 90s, late 80s into her 90s, which is crazy, yeah. and that she totally gets it too, which is amazing. Uh, but no, she passed just like Edna Krabappel. They retired from the show. Uh, they clearly wrote it. I wouldn't be surprised if an earlier version of the script before she would have would have included one of the biggest characters. But they respectfully. Uh, I wonder if there's movies in memory of her. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't finish the credits. I apologize. Now, Neil, as someone who hadn't gone back at all to Zim right. in the last fifteen years or something like that, yeah. Um, did that opening recap, that amazing Eastern anime styled recap. From Dibs POV, did it, did it kind of bring everything back? Like, okay, here are the ABCs of Zim. No, well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I remembered like, yeah, Dib is always after Zim, and you know, no one ever believes him, and it's Zim. one of those kind of stories. And Zim is Zim, and uh, that's that's all I really needed to remember. But just just opening with that like completely different style. What would you say it is? Because I, I, I'm not versed in enough anime to know like if they're going for a specific one or if they're just going for artsy, dramatic 
Um, it's like fantasy. in Teen Titans Go. It's like in the Teen Titans Go movie. It's too good for the subject matter. Yeah. Like you're right. It is that over detailed. Like this is like for an adult. This is like if they're going to remake Akira in 2020. Like ooh, this is ooh, no, serious. It's, it's like yeah. it's really really good, fun, dramatic. I don't know if the, it's the, Cowboy Bebop, the visuals, or like Vampire or Hunter D or, or something like that. It's the, like yeah, the visuals were done by a fellow named Spencer Wan. Okay, uh, and my God. The, the 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 real I, the real cherry on top for that bit because it's like a minute long and it just brings you up to speed on the ABCs of Zim. This very masculine looking dib with he <laughs> looks so badass. And yeah. the, there's this amazing line. It's the first bit of like synced diegetic dialogue, and he says like, "My name is Dib Membrane, and I am 12 years old." <laughs> So like even if you and don't know like him, it's like a forty-year-old man. In this I love animation. it. Yeah. Looks, you're right. Has it Spangler from yeah. the real Ghostbusters there's or the, something? There's the epi- you're right. Where like his hair is nerdy yet cool. It's it's cool. Yeah. it works for <laughs> yeah with the little pompadour in the top front. Uh, there is an episode of Zim that was total fan service of its a and Dib is a hero in his own mind where he gets to he grows up he finds Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster and everything else he has he, he captures Zim and defeats him yeah. and he as an adult single-handedly defeats the Urken Armada and it's everything he ever wanted and he will have none of it he's never going to get any of the things he wants in life yeah and- <laughs> now did the uh, did the show ever do this kind of mixed media thing where it would switch to a different style not that I ever remember. Not like this. I mean, the closest, I know this is what you're getting at, but they would do like CG complementing the 2D. Yeah, yeah. But like, that's, was... that's not really what you're getting at. Okay, yeah. yeah. So that's, because because I imagine, yeah, there was some anime influence on the show because it was oh, the early totally. 2000s yep. and that was just how you did it. And that's part of what made the show um, so unique. Um, I feel like it's dialed up a lot in this because this this movie goes so all out with the the sci-fi elements and the sci-fi adventure and there's so many fine details and just cool tech it's everything you want it. Yeah. oh my god like you're talking about the low bar that I was coming into this with because I just I two things one I just was worried Vasquez would he, like he he would come off apathetic mm-hmm. right that yeah. that he'd be like I'm just doing this to like make money which sounds mean having now seen it I I was wrong. (laughs) He he, he really took it seriously. The second thing was when I saw the first ads, the trailers and such, uh, I've read the Invader Zim comics that were published in the last couple of years and I love them. And Vasquez wrote the first five or six and there was straight up like panels from the comic in the movie trailer. And Mm -hmm. I was thinking, oh no, did Vasquez just repurpose the script from these comics? He he did not. The only thing he really took was Dib getting out of shape and Zim and him like having their argument in the lawn and like Dib realizing, oh, I got to work out so I can get my my shit back together. But man, he really wrote like a cool sci-fi movie that paid off everything. The membrane stuff, like things I didn't think would come back, like tax ship and all of that. And I think they do a good job onboarding you over the course of the 70 minutes, like getting you ready for the last 25 where it really just becomes like, okay, everyone, all all the plates are spinning. Okay, let's do a kick-ass sci-fi movie now. Yeah. Yeah. I had no trouble jumping back into it, not remembering. Because as you you were pointing out, all the things that were callbacks or like one off characters that were brought back. Yeah. To me, those were just uh yeah, that's the Invader Zim universe. Yeah, it's okay mm-hmm. if there's like a weirdo over there, you know, like <laughs> people with like stitches over their foreheads. Yeah, that doesn't. I'm not confused by that because everything is like that. <laughs> Nothing is explained. Um, we, man. Sure. So I got to bring this up. There's so many good jokes in it. We need to do a quick round table about ever like just a quick like a favorite joke or a gag that stuck out. You mentioning these off the cuff, like, oh, background character references to yeah. old stuff. Man, Ryan and I were pissing ourselves at Bloody's Pizza Hog. Oh, God. That oh, really my- got me, too. And <laughs> I don't I don't remember. I was like, what is that from? What's the <laughs> reference there? That was in an episode or two, right? Oh, yeah, Bloody's Pizza Hog is, he's like a mascot of sorts. The show had a few people like this. My personal favorite was Poop Dog. Yeah. He was the mascot for the Poop Cola Corporation. Who also sold candy bars made entirely out of sawdust. Yeah, I think the problem is that this show. Although I watched it, I was not. I was too old to be like parked on Nickelodeon all the time, like I would have been as a kid. So I didn't catch reruns of this show, and I never revisited it. So this was not like a uh, avalanche of nostalgia for me. Which I the was, Rocco thing kind of does, and it's sort of like a thesis point. It needed it, it, it to it make does, a point. But Rocco was also a show I caught on reruns all the time. Yeah, yeah. So I just remembered a lot of those references. Whereas this, uh. It wasn't. It wasn't like that for me. It's personal, but yeah. I. But I. 
it I never, never I never way. felt like I wasn't getting the joke. It never got in the way. Yeah. Which kind of separates it from things like the Lego movies and like um, maybe even a little bit of Spider-Verse for me. Uh, and okay, so was there a certain joke that like just stuck out to you that like really got you? For me, it was when... When Zim is explaining these are the parameters of phase two with his confidence, what classic Zim, a confidence based on nothing. And he shows in the picture, and we actually pause there because you see the name of the, ch- it's called chairdib.jpg. <laughs> <laughs> Even as a member of like this alien race with this crazy alien technology, he still saves JPEG. Like, JPEG uh, picture compression is still the JPEG. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's no point in getting rid of the JPEG. <laughs> <laughs> I, I no particular joke is jumping out to me. One is, but it's a spoiler. I don't necessarily want to say it. Okay. Um. It's uh. It's it's the end. It's what happens with the. Uh, okay. The, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah the tallest. Me, yeah. Sure. Sure. That was great. Um. The, there's just there's so many good jokes. There's a ton, and like I said, you might ha- like you might in the middle like just get tired of laughing a little bit, or just yeah. get tired of like having to keep your eyes open to like catch every little background. They don't waste a second. Detail. If you no. want it, like when you, when you see 70 minutes, like, okay, I'm only getting 70 minutes of Zim, but hot damn. 70 you, minutes of Zim is like 200 minutes of any other the, cartoon. The credits are like 30 seconds too. They're like, dun, 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 Like yeah. this movie wastes no time. Even, even the time wasting elements like Dib and Zim uh, arguing on Zim's front lawn, which eats up minutes of this movie it's just mm-hmm. the two of them on a lawn just kind of like puffing their chest talking crap to each other it's very anime it's just like a lot of like dolly moves and like the the movie's kind of showing off in that scene like oh look like we can kind of do these cool pans now and zim is like keyframed not keyframed he's, he's animated frame by frame very well like their their line of sight can move in 3d space it looks better than the old show yeah but it looks authentic to the old show like i that scene is a time waster because it takes it's up until the 10 minute mark. They're just arguing on a goddamn lawn about how much better they are than the other yeah. one. But it all resolves. It has a punchline. It's there, so it funny. has like a master punchline, which the show is just so. Uh, <laughs> well, it's just like not the kind of show where you expect there to be any craft to the writing. Yeah. Um, because it's so. Yeah. It's like. Uh, it's It really is just working off of, um, you know, like. I don't know if it's improv, but a lot of a lot of the jokes come from actors delivering the lines in really idiosyncratic ways that yeah. I imagine were probably something that they came up with while recording. The table reads probably. Yeah, because how do you write something like that where, yeah. Yeah, we were watching the Mega Doomer episode before we watched the movie, and there's this amazing laugh where uh, Dib and Zim uh, part ways. It's clearly the end of a big action scene. Yeah. And then off camera, as you know, on camera, Dib walks into his house and shuts the door. And off camera, you just hear Richard Horvitz go, I am Zim. And it cuts to the next <laughs> scene. Like it just, <laughs> it's completely pointless. Right. It did remind you, I guess, that he's not dead. Yeah. But like shit like that, that Zim is constituted almost entirely from that, like just natural cadences. The audio, the editing of this was so good. Yeah. The editing, it's, it's really, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, how many writers were credited on this? Did you notice? Um, I'm looking right now at the credits and let's see. Shout out to Jenny Goldberg, the art director, because my God, this whole movie looks so good. It's and really consistent. gorgeous. The colors in the background. And, and it abandoned nothing from that like early 2000s art style. Oh, it takes all the best parts and colors and stuff from that. Like the character yeah. models are all updated perfectly. The color, my God, it's the color good in this movie. Um, writers, writers, I'm looking right now. Writer's credit, there's three. Okay. Uh, Bren Burns, Jonathan Vasquez, and Gary Wilson. All right, so that makes sense to me because this is not a big, this is not a writer's room kind of thing. This yeah. is like a storyboard. Like all the, there's so there's a lot of visual humor. There's a lot of acting humor. If you just looked at the script, just the dialogue, it wouldn't be that funny, right? But Richard Horvitz gets in front of a microphone. Yeah, like, oh my magic, God, yeah. man. Oh my God, freaking uh, Andy Berman as Dib was, oh my God, when Dib does the impersonation of his dad and he's like an Italian sounding Yoda. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, how do you not know? So like, they, yeah, they, they, they have... Um, your father has a very distinctive voice and it's not that. Exactly, yeah, they pointed it's basic, out. It's Dr. Orpheus from, uh, yeah, from Venture Brothers. But it's then like that's so exact. Well, that's, that joke pays off later when it's him in his imagination and he has that voice in <laughs> Dib's imagination as well. <laughs> Perspective holds up, but so okay. So you don't have a joke. You, you don't have like a favorite joke you want to spoil. 
No, no, no. I think we're we're can, we're hitting on plenty of good. Can, jokes can I talk here. about the 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 uh, the the um, the, uh, the the crown the uh, throne the throne. <gasps> okay. Yes. God damn the throne. I tweeted about this. Oh man, just watch the movie before you listen to this podcast because I have to talk about this. Zim demands a throne be made by Gur. To, to, so he could be worshipped upon it. He gets on this throne, this and, super tall throne. It's like just it looks like like twenty chairs stacked vertically, <laughs> and like he gets to the top, and he looks to the left and right, and there's a button that looks like peanuts, and a button to the right that looks like flames. And Zim hits the flames button, and behind him there are a bunch of these pipes, and a bunch of peanuts start to shoot out. <laughs> and uh, Gur, his servant robot on the ground, just yells up, "Hey, try try hitting the peanut button." <laughs> <laughs> Which is already funny. Like you think this—that's just the punchline that like the buttons are reversed. Yeah. So Zim hits the, the the peanut button, and then fire starts to come out, and Zim gets all excited, like, "Okay, okay." Laughing maniacally. Yeah, I got my fire. I got my fire. Yeah. And then the chair starts to fuck up, and then the throne starts to shoot out peanuts and fire at the same time. <laughs> and Zim just goes with it. He's like, "All right, fine, fuck it." And he just goes with it, but he's dodging these fl- <laughs> flaming peanuts. <laughs> and going, oh, 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 oh. Instead of admitting it hurts, like no, no. I'm oh not. my god, the animation! Oh my god, of Zim just like dodging the peanuts while getting his laughs in in between the peanuts, but singeing his shoulders. It's, it's just, a, yeah, it's that's a great setup for a joke. You you, you don't expect the scene is going to end with Zim dodging peanuts that are on <laughs> fire, own throne. but it feels very natural in the moment. Which it just is builds great. and builds. It's like yeah. a it's like a, probably a good minute of the movie. Just this one scene, and it's a great example of that. No, these people care and like the storyboarding the, the the delivery the art direction all of it comes together like that it's such a wonderful piece of comedy this whole movie yeah it, yeah it's like the style of comedy it'll th- it, it'll trick you into thinking that it's like annoying orange or that kind of just like twitchy like improvised teenage humor that's the worst really not of, that funny it's just yeah. showing off and being loud yeah um but there is actually like this is controlled chaos Yes. I think. And it, it does it, it, it. and it does occasionally slow down and give you a breather with things like the ham joke. Uh, yeah. Uh or um when um when uh, some of the more touching moments between Professor Membrane and Dib, like it kind of does do And Gaz too. Gaz, Gaz too. Gaz oh is, yeah. yeah, Gaz is great in it. You were happy you you Ryan, you, I remember you texting me that you were really happy with Gaz in the movie. I yeah, I, I always thought that Gaz was she was never it's funny, Gaz though is Gaz doesn't really work as the main character of like the one or two times. I know when she went to the mall to get her video game, there may I remember that episode. GS2. Yeah. yeah and uh she by the way, in this she was playing her GS4. Did you see that? Yeah. Oh, that, oh nice. That's great. But her her role is always mostly just like as a little button to like drive home that Dib looks like a nut. Like, yes. Right? Yeah. That she's like, I'm not only like it, here the only thing worse, Dib, than the entire world not believing in you and not respecting you and thinking you're nuts is I do believe you. And I just don't care. Yeah. I don't care. Like he's an alien. Like I know, and I don't care. He's that, he's gonna screw up. Who cares? Oh, yeah, she's <laughs> like it's Zim. We've been doing this for years. I don't care. Yeah, I, mean, I God, every I will say. Yeah. All right, there are a big criticism you could make for the Rocco movie would be the fact that it's too self-aware. It's too aware of like you are a product of the '90s and the world is different now. This doesn't, it's very much, much more scarcely cites itself or self-referential. Uh, but I did really enjoy when Richard Horvitz said, I need a lozenger. <laughs> it's because I've seen interviews with him saying, like he openly says, was doing Zim hard on my voice. Pregnant pause. Yes. Like <laughs> Zim is, I mean, it's just in the sound booth. It, it hurts. It's really hard to do this guy. If you have a vague memory of Zim being Dib and Zim just screaming each other's names. Yeah. 15, 20 minutes into this movie, there's there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it in the first 15, 20 minutes. It doesn't stop. But by the 15, 20 minute mark, I remember thinking like, God damn, these guys really are just screaming at yeah. each other. A great note that show don't tell. I thought one of the weakest jokes of the television show was always that everyone said that Dib had a big head because his head is no bigger <laughs> than any other characters. They yeah. all are kind of awkwardly the same size. Right. Even the adults have the same size head. Gaz is a little smaller because she's a smaller person. Zim has a different shaped head because he's an alien. But as a, when he's in his human suit, which is not a suit, it's the <laughs> same. And yet when we see Dib on camera, he looks like his head is enormous. Yeah. They're like, yeah, show, don't tell. Like, oh, by the way, like, you really do, like, you look like you have a really big head. Like, Dib look looks how- bad on camera. Yeah. That's so funny. D- man, 
I have one more joke I just got to talk Please. about. Okay. When, when Zim goes into his lair and there's that giant machine that takes off his disguise like he's Tony Stark getting out of the Iron Man suit. <laughs> And it's just like this giant arm that takes off his little pompadour wig and his two contacts. Yeah. Like the, like the little, the little labor the machine has to put in the little like suck yeah. to get the, God damn, like just good animation jokes. You just don't see that. Like most animation nowadays is just so clean and keyframed and, and writer, it's writer room oriented, which means all the jokes come from people coming up with dialogue not animators coming up with funny animation but, and like they, in all like Bingo. in all yeah. the creative expression that you really get is like like the character models and like the color and such it's not really the momentum and the speed and the, yeah. like the squish and squash or whatever you want to call it um but goddamn zim's got it there's a lot of it in the movie just like little itty bitty bits where like, like when zim uh is a chewing out dib over not having a spaceship that can fly he goes that's right you don't have a spaceship that can fly and his teeth get all like serrated and narrow for mm-hmm. just like one second like god damn it's funny like it, it the whole movie is such a it really felt like vasquez proved like no i've got the goods like like give me i could I, I, do you want to see him do more zim stuff or just something completely different more zim more zim <laughs> just more zim no this could this convinced me like oh my god just bring this series back it would do maybe better now i think yeah what about you ryan Oh, I'm split there. I, if they were to do the series, I'd want it to be like they, they take their time and really sink their teeth in. Because I think back to some of the later episodes of Zim, like fan service where Dib just lives out his fantasy. Yeah. Or we're do, let's do a Gaz episode. Yeah, it felt, like, you know, it felt like Vasquez got tired. And like there are some where it just didn't, it, it felt tired. It felt like the energy wasn't being put in the room. But then when they really sink their teeth in, like the Christmas special in this oh movie, you go like, Christmas yeah, special. take your time. Yeah. And, and now with that being said, if it takes another like 10 years, I'll still watch it. Yeah, I'll still what am watch I talking it. About? Yeah. I Would you rather, so are you saying, I, I, I feel like the Ryan Murphy answer is I want a mini series. Yeah. You want like, like, but not five, like next year. I five want to, to 10 like episodes. Take, take their time. If yeah. they want to do more specials like Futurama was doing for a while there. That would be a good way to the go. Future, okay, so going back to how we, I was saying, oh, it's great that Netflix picked these up and they were allowed to do whatever they wanted and Nickelodeon gave them long leashes and like a lot of money and all the time in the world. Rocco was 45, this was 70. Those timetables, like those runtimes fit those projects perfectly. Uh, I can easily imagine, okay, when Futurama came back, yeah, those like, oh, we're going to make movies that we also divide up into seasons of TV made them bad episodes and bad movies. Like they didn't pick a lane hard enough. Oh yeah, well that's not what I'm saying. Okay, what I'm saying is yeah. a perfectly uh, viable way to continue the Invader Zim, uh, you know, legacy would be to make another 70 minute, um, yeah. you know, special every once in a while. You know. Yeah, I, I guess I would. I want to have a little more downtime. I want them to be given like the episodic tome the timetables because i want more content but i want to take breaks <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know it, well I, I want like i want well, to see that, yeah. i want to see them fart around in the school you know like like the simpsons movie was good but it didn't have a lot of that breathing room of like bart and lisa walking home from school yeah or homer at work scratching his butt not doing anything like i kind of want like the throwaway time like the wasted hours so to speak of just zim and dib doing whatever just i want i want that one more time because like my favorite episodes of Zim, you know, in the like, because I don't think it got terrible towards the end of the first run, but the the weakest episodes really are in the last like five or six. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like my favorite ones really are just like them kicking around doing nothing important, like like the Balonius Maximus episode. Yeah, my God, like that isn't a plot driven script. It doesn't move the Zim formula forward in any way. Uh, it's just. Do, do you remember that one? I vaguely recall people turning Did, to Baloney or it, something. It, like, it's yeah. it's the 1986 Fly movie, but Dibs yes. turning it okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> turning it to Baloney. I don't know. I could talk about this forever. I'm overstimulated by this conversation because I love Zim. Yeah, if you haven't watched it yet, pick the right friends to watch it with. I feel like if you're kind of if you're just alone and you're in a flat mood, this might not be an amusing movie. Yeah, it, it might just like grate on you. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. So, I will. Say, yeah. It's funny to when I think about being given this free license, both intellectual properties coming out the same time on the same platform. The only thing that was even sort of kind of maybe like this was it's now famous. You can come find it on the internet. It's, uh, the, the audio recording for the script for bye, bye beavers. 
last, oh, yeah. yep, the last episode that never aired and never got fit. It was written but never filmed of Angry Beavers, of which, of course, Daggett is Richard Horvitz, who sounds it's it's Zim yes. turned way down. It's not yeah. nearly <laughs> the energy of Zim, but who is or Alpha Five? It's self-aware and it's meta and it's again i i won't spoil what makes it great because it really is fun it's great the character as the, the voice actors start to just break down and refer to each other by other characters they voiced <laughs> and by their actual given name no, they call, like, doesn't he get called like salem at one point yeah the salem the cat from <laughs> sabrina the teenage witch she just like yeah that's your other thing right it you doesn't tell, matter yeah you're telling me there's like a lot of meta stuff where they like complain about animators not getting royalties and stuff yes, yes they it, do. it's like ten, it's not even 10 minutes long and it's well, but, yeah, uh, my, that would have been the last episode of Vinger Beep. Yeah, my um, my response was, uh, oh, I wonder why they didn't produce that episode. Why, why did Nickelodeon <laughs> give them like two hundred thousand dollars to make that? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, it sounds like it makes sense that it was never made. Uh, totally. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fun to listen to. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, between those three separate intellectual properties, none of them take the low road of man, cartoons used to be better. And that so could have been, that was that was the unspoken fear in the room of they could just do cartoon, angry old man yelling at cloud, cartoons used to be better. My thing, like, am I out of touch? No, it's the children who are wrong. Rock, Rocco has it both ways. And it's mature and it works in that they, they kind of dump on lazily animated computer, like CG cartoons. Like they, 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 they kind of dump on it very briefly with the fat heads. Yeah. They do show the CGI reboot of the fat heads, which looks kind of like a uh, grum from Tim and Eric Yeah, with a little bit of, this is a deep cut here. Do you remember on the Beetlejuice cartoon, there was a CGI character who would show up every yeah. once in a while. Yeah. And wasn't he only on television? He was, or, yeah, or when they were channel, fl- door or? they'd channel flip and he'd be there. He was in the opening credits. Yeah, I can do. I couldn't find, I, I, I've tried looking up that character and I couldn't find any footage of him, but he's real. I swear to God, he's real. <laughs> I remember. Okay. <laughs> um, reminded me a little bit of that. Um, but the Rocco towards the end, like when they really tell you the point of the whole mm-hmm. 45 minutes, they, they are saying like, okay, but you got to move on. You can't always hold on to the same things the way they were. I do love the baby fat head. Yeah, that was such a great way of like saying like this would instill fan outrage. Like what? You changed it. You put a baby fat head. In? Like, that's so something yeah. they would do. And, and Rocco flips his shit. And yeah, she- everyone loves it. But hit. But the one man trying to like, but I just want exactly the same. Like, then you're the problem now, Rocco. Yeah, you yeah. Move yeah. On. I am legend. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, again, is not quite in character for Rocco. He I, f- I feel like there'll be more of a Filbert thing. But for to, yeah. 45 minutes to be made like 20 years later. No, yeah. More than but, 20 years yeah, later. Yeah, but Rocco was never the Archie Bunker of the show. I oh, guess. yeah. 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 Um, but whatever, it works in the story. Yeah. It reminds me, I miss my Archie Bunker on that show. I miss Heifer's dad. Heifer's <laughs> dad? <Yeah. laughs> He's ridiculous. And Makes Al Bundy look civilized. Ex- exactly. Yeah. Man. All right, let's take a quick break and we'll come back with, I don't know, another segment. Here we are at the Q&A section of this episode of Guaranteed Audio, which is when our patrons, which could be you if you put a dollar in every month or more over at guaranteedaudio.com, our patrons get to ask questions that we answer on the show. Uh, and we try to avoid the narcissistic ones, but we inevitably always ask them. Case in point, Pika Bread has written in and asked us, if you were to direct a Netflix cartoon remake similar to the Invader Zim or Rocco's Modern Life one, what 90s cartoon would you reboot? And would there be any major changes like Rocco? And I should add that a few other people asked similar questions, like Michael Kickenrad Corliss asked if we could bring back any 90s TV show for a final episode. So let's just make it that. If you could bring back any old show and make either a final Not episode or a Not just a Nicktoon? Eight. Let's say anything. Okay. I'll think in the Nick purview. I would have said Zim probably, Yeah, but I shouldn't have been the one to make it. None of us should. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'll take Doug. Yeah. Because Excellent. Doug was ruined by Disney. Yes. And uh, they did make a movie and it wasn't good. Doug was the first thing to be ruined by Disney. <laughs> Arguably. Um, Doug is a hipster in that regard. Uh, but I'd like to take Doug back to his roots. I don't know. Actually, I don't think that would be that fun to reboot. I'll, I'll think about my answer. Ryan, do you have something to say? Well, number one, in my, in my heart, in my heart, in my mind, Doug ends at the Grand Canyon. Yes, yeah. the Disney Doug, oh. I, don't, I don't recognize. The show ends pretty solidly of Doug and the funny family. <laughs> uh, yeah. That is actually a really nice last episode. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, they, the, do a, they do a very succinct job. And doesn't like, isn't the penultimate uh, short, I don't know, because I mean, every episode was two ep- ep- like stories. 12-minute episodes. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the penultimate one is Roger... 
like ducks out of graduation yes. in junior high, right? And That's Doug right. has to convince him to come. Yeah, both episodes are great. Like yeah. end of series what episodes. What was Roger scared of? Just getting older. Yeah, yeah. Right. existentialism, <laughs> which is great. For Fifth Roger grade. Cox. I, don't <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get older. Um, I I've thought before that um real Ghostbusters should be brought back uh as a uh mini like a, like a 70 minute tv movie or a video game like cell shaded to look like the old game the old uh, show mm-hmm. um i love real ghostbusters i think real ghostbusters is kind of almost its own thing it's not a nicktoon though <laughs> i know but some of the questions didn't specify nick oh, okay if i was thinking about a nickelodeon show um i know they're bringing back are you afraid of the dark next uh, oh. oh yeah that's y- a great idea yeah well we'll see because they've tried to bring it back before and like bringing back the twilight zone frequently you just it's hard because your memories of those old shows are only of the best yeah. episodes. Exactly. So when you come out and you have like 10 episodes and only six of them are perfect, <laughs> you know what I mean? It all it takes is one bad one in that first batch for people to go, oh, it's not as good as the old one. It's like, yeah, but how many bad episodes of Are You Afraid of the Dark or The Twilight Zone were there? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's some great ones for sure, but there are bad episodes of those shows. Um, Goosebumps, for example, a almost few, every episode is bad. <laughs> a few Christmases ago, or no, birthdays ago, my brother got me like uh, the best of the Twilight Zone, yeah. uh, t- two Blu-ray set, and like, yeah, these are just the episodes you want to watch. Like, it doesn't really matter. Like, they're from seasons one, two, three, four, and five, and these yeah. are the good ones. Like, and like, and it's a great. Get- Thank you again, Sean. But yeah, like, I don't need to rewatch another western. Ooh, you mean we already got that set and them cowboy hats and them boots? Are they ghosts? Yes, they're ghosts. <laughs> they're ghosts. I like, was just thinking, of, how would you bring back, hey, uh, not Hey Dude, how would you bring back Salute Your Shorts? Uh, it would just be like a shitty Wet Hot American Summer. It would just be it? that the actors oh, from that oh. show are now the adults run as camp counselors. What if they're still playing kids? That's uh, just Wet Hot American Summer. I know, that's yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah. thinking. I, think, I mean, every Nicktoon in particular that you'd want to bring back, either they did it or it's not off air. Like SpongeBob, mm-hmm. it'd be like, yeah, it's still on, basically. Yeah. Uh, Zim got brought back perfectly Rocco had a great ca- uh, cap you know put on like okay it's over I wouldn't want to bring back Ren Stimpy I tried that already yeah Angry Beavers I w- yeah the re- oh, God, the Ren Stimpy reboot was so bad Um, Angry Beavers I'd love to see that last episode just animated properly me too that, it'd yeah be, it'd yeah. be like Duck Amuck is that what it's called the Warner Brothers cartoon yeah. <laughs> it'd be like that that's kind yeah, of what it is he turns into like like an umbrella for a tail and like the all white background of recognizing having an existential crisis it's almost like yeah. his brain's a little disconnected from the matrix and he sees the man behind the curtain it's a cartoon like oh no yeah now I know they are bringing Rugrats back right they're playing of course it on it. they are why not like the fourth goddamn reincarnation of I know Rugrats. but I think you could <sighs> There, there is such charm with the original Rugrats. Will it be Klasky and Supo? Will they? <laughs> I don't think so. I think they've fallen the on D for it. divorce I, is a capital D right I, now. I don't know if they got divorced or something, but their website sure now is like literally like a GeoCities website or oh. something. I don't know what happened to them. But if you could bring back Rugrats with, um, uh, oh, what's the name of the guy, the the Aeon Flux guy who did the uh, the pilot episode of Rugrats? Oh yeah. Have I ever talked about this on the podcast before? No, but nope. I know what you're talking about. There is. It wasn't an aired pilot. It wasn't the kind that you like would see on TV. But there was like it's online now. You can find. It's a trip. Yeah this 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 crazy like proof of concept for Rugrats. That's um, uh, I'm just blanking on the name of the animator. But th- this guy who went on to do Aeon Flux, um, directed this short about a baby trying to get to a toilet. Peter Chung? Peter Chung. Yeah, thank you. And um and it's what became the opening titles of Rugrats. Yeah, it's got you know how the opening titles are a little bit weirder and a little more POV and like Wide exaggerated. Wide angle at the way yeah. a baby looks, sees things distorted. Everything looks so big yeah. and it's yeah. like it this feels like, you know, if if Rugrats never happened, I feel like this would have been like an Oscar nominated short or something. It's kind of like you'd that. see in cartoon sushi or liquid television. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um so uh, I would love to bring Rugrats back into that weird baby vision world where it's deliberately surreal and the disparity between what babies are seeing and what the grownups are seeing is really pronounced. And that's kind of the whole point of the show. Yeah. Whereas what Rugrats became was a lot more like cash cow cash cow it and got like, reinvented after the third, fourth season and the creators weren't that happy with it. I guess apparently Chucky's mother was something that the creators wanted to do an episode about. Mm-hmm. And Viacom, Nickelodeon kept saying, no, no, no. They did eventually. They though. did do yeah. that. The and movie. It was, and it was like literally like like the first thing they did after they kicked the original creators off the show. They basically bought the IP from them. Okay. Like, okay, we're going to make Rugrats now. You can go away. 
we're going to like write in a bunch of other babies and come up with dill and all this stuff. And like one of the first things they did was the mother's day special with Chucky's mother. And like the creators feel like it was, I think the word they used was what's the word. They basically said like, Oh, it was like very maudlin. Is that the word? What's the word when things are like, yeah, yeah. Sad, yeah. yeah sad for the sake of sad. And they were like, they, Baccarin, yeah. they weren't happy with it. They, they, they were like, this is kind of like, I've gone back and watched that episode in the last few years. And it is kind of like it's a little too much. It's just, it's just all it is, is like, isn't this sad? But Rugrats like, could do sentimental. Oh, uh, it could. The episode with Melville, the bug. Oh, no, there's great one. Yeah, it, it is really great. That doesn't fit with this other vision of Rugrats I have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, but it is kind of what I love about Rugrats was basically the the intro shots that were really close ups of objects. You know, Rugrats. <laughs> you know, I think you like about Rugrats based off that short you made on YouTube years ago. Yeah. Because I think what you like, and I think this is sort of the secret DNA to that show when it's working, is. You know how your memory is real fuzzy from when you were that age, yes. like two or younger, but you do kind of have a memory from that. It's harder the older you get. Mm-hmm. You know how there's like, oh, it's like almost like organic TV static. Like, you, you know, how like if you have like the, like the wrong uh, vertical hold on UHF signals coming into a TV and everything's kind of warped a certain yeah. way, like a cable box. Yep. Yeah. That's kind of how your memory looks when you think back that far. Like it's just it's too distorted. You can't quite remember. That's what Rugrats looks like. Yeah, it's amazing that yeah. I think that's what they were tapping into and what they were going for with parts of that show, which is an amazing thing to be able to animate, like, yeah. to realize. Yeah, and to take that weirdness out of it, to give them like stronger bones and to make them look more like traditional cartoons does take a lot of the magic out of it. Because we, yeah. we don't really know what a baby's perspective looks like. We don't get to ask them. They don't yeah. have basic language skills. Yeah. But we know we can observe the way that they stare around the world and what they're seeing is definitely not the same experience. Sure. Whatever it is, it's nuts. Yeah. yeah. Well, for, specifically with the Nicktoons, I think like under an hour project for All Real Monsters could be good. Ooh, I yeah. think they could do a fun All Real Monsters. Uh, how exactly? The most obvious thing to do would be the monsters are outed and they now live in. Yeah, they have to like exist with the humans in the real world and stuff. Scared that the their secret urban arcanum Harry Potter behind nine and three quarters. They're out like True Blood where the vampires are out in public or yeah, and a million other intellectual properties with a secret supernatural underworld that something happened or you just make a good, how about like, Hey, every Halloween we do some fucked up shit or like something. I don't know. They probably have to figure out a way to differentiate itself from Monsters Inc. Monsters Inc. is the same thing. Kind of. Yeah. It's, Though yeah. They, I, um, they came first. If they I did come first. They By, really did. Yep. I can see not real monsters resurgence working. They're running out of, Stuff to bring back. I still haven't watched the Hey Arnold stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't either. I, wow. I, I started Probably. watching Hey Arnold when the voice actors changed. I really fell off during that. Yeah, I mean, we all like Hey Arnold, but it just was never that uh, attention grabbing. I, I liked watching it at night. Like when yeah. it premiered at 8 p.m., I'd watch it. Pretty comforting show. Hey, they should have Hey Arnold and Rugrats do a crossover so no one isn't having a good time. <laughs> I mean, literally no one. I'm going to zig here. We got a question from... Uh, Raxabetal LX, large, I guess. Uh, guys, what's your favorite Weird Al song? Ooh. Albuquerque. Albuquerque's great. Albuquerque's cool. I love This Is The Life. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> that great. Oh, that, yeah, that's Got a solid that a Cadillac. One. I, make a I love the production. The production on that song is so good. Yeah. What um, up? What up? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was always a fan of Dare to Be Stupid. That got mm. me into Devo. I was a fan of... Uh, um, uh, Dog Eat Dog, which got me into Talking Heads. I was a fan of You Make Me, which got me into Oingo Boingo. Yep. Weird Al was like such a good jumping off the point. The gateway for all to... Yeah. <laughs> it's like he, I love really all the is. same bands that he was into now. Yeah. And I'm trying to think, but um, I, I was always one... a fan of Everything You Know Is Wrong, which got me into They Might oh, Be Giants. Oh, I forgot. I love that song. It's a good one. It's so catchy. It's honestly like... It's one of the most fun in terms of like writing and melody that Al has ever done, I think. <laughs> Knucklehead McSpazitan asks. <laughs> it's great. Say that again. Knucklehead McSpazitan. Knucklehead has- McSpazitan asks, are the colored microphones actually your guys' favorite colors? Now, for people listening who've never seen any photos of our show, we have microphones that are color coded. Even the XLR cables we connect our microphones to our mixer and recorder are color coded. Ryan is usually red. Neil is yellow. I am blue. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, the origin of this is weird in that we we just thought back when we were making the new kids on the rock stuff, our earlier YouTube uh, collaborations. It'd be funny to go Power Rangers with it and color code our characters. Or for the kids who are either like 
don't have great like skills at reading the room or just are like barely tuning in of yeah. like, hey, which co- which Power Ranger is the blue one? Like he's the one that only wears blue. Yeah, he always it's wears stupid. blue. Stupid. Yeah. Well, the thing is, we broke our own rules though because like I always wore a red flannel shirt. Right. And I, I'm not red. <laughs> You know what I mean? No, I think it. I think it originated with um, we did the fake DVD commercial. Yes, and we we kind of zap into the room on a little rainbow. We just quickly decided who's what color. Yeah, and then I think we reused it for our our little hearts that we have in the Christmas. Yeah, uh, and then we just stuck with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're still doing it. The reason we have different colored microphones though, is to keep them separate and the germs. because yeah, the germs and like we get really close to our microphones and if I were, it would be basically the same as kissing, I think. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> well, right now Neil is using a SM seven B, which is a shore microphone. It's a podcast standard. It was the same type of microphone used to record thriller. Mm-hmm. Great microphone. That doesn't really have a color on it. Would it's just you, black. Would you ever be willing to get like a yellow microphone slip? Because you have the yellow. I don't know if you can take. I'm. I, I'm sure you can take it off somehow, but it's a little bit like stuck on there. Yeah. Um, if we ever did like a live panel of sorts or whatever, I'd ask you to. All right. Yeah. I just imagine a context for like, hey, look, we changed colors. Isn't that crazy? And the response would be like, oh, you always use the same color. I'd never <laughs> noticed. <laughs> Some of these, we have a lot of good questions but here. To answer their question, yeah, yeah. is red my favorite color? Uh, if you'd asked me in third grade, uh, yeah, actually, red was always my favorite color growing up. And it's funny because I'm 33 years old, and somebody asked me what my favorite, an adult, not a child, an adult asked me what my favorite color was last week. And I went with dark purple. But hmm. yeah. uh, because I think that's good a answer. question that, an answer that can change, or maybe of a short list. Or maybe that is a child's question, but you know what? The hell with it. It's still a really good question. So thank you. What about you, Kevin? Is blue your favorite color? Oh, I'm red. Red's my favorite color. Huh. Oh, that's tricky. Yeah. Yellow is absolutely not my favorite color. <laughs> yeah. Um, I get that it works for me. If we were a cartoon, you'd probably make me blonde, right? <laughs> to differentiate <laughs> yeah. your colors. Go for your ghost Yeah. 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 Um, my actual favorite color, I think, has always been teal. Hmm. Ah, cool. I love that it's halfway between blue and green. Mm. A teal mic would be awesome looking, or some XLR cords. Something we could purchase with all that awesome Patreon money. Thank you again, all our patrons yeah. supporting us at home. You're gonna buy a teal XLR cable, anyways. <laughs> our ex- we, we, that was like our big spend this quarter. Was hey guys, I think we need to get some new XLR cables. I'm gonna spend eighteen dollars. <laughs> um, we got a lot of good questions here. That no, keep we, going. We these are good. Of, we sort of covered these in um, our discussions about Rocco and Zim, but. Um, um, Bella asks, Hey, was there ever a cartoon you hated as children and refused to watch? I, the SpongeBob thing for me, um, mm-hmm. I just resented it because for some, it's unfair and it was super immature. I just equated it with, Oh, this is the reason Zim's not on is because they got to make room for stuff like SpongeBob. That's a little more goofy and upbeat and Zim is too moody, but there's clearly other factors behind the scenes. Zim was such a cash cow for Nickelodeon. Was I've, there a show you guys? I've, just- I've gone on a rants before this, uh, Rugrats all grown up. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. first of all, came up, you know, when I was at that age where I'm moving on from Nicktoons, I don't need to watch them all the time. And a lot of the shows that came out then were that show for me that I just, I have no interest in watching, but Rugrats all grown up just pisses me off so much. Yeah, conceptually, conceptually, the entire point of Rugrats <laughs> is their babies. Yeah. You're, you're moving, you're inching them one step closer you're, to like, they're like dating and stuff and driving cars. It's like, what the hell is the point of watching Tommy pickles become a teenager? Like there's no point. There's no point. But it's, you, uh, <laughs> it's like, I don't know. It's well, what if know- the family from Alf didn't know Alf? Like, <laughs> <laughs> What if there was no alien in that show? Like, yeah. who cares? All right. Yeah. Angelica's going to talk to an adult. Like, what are you fucking soft in the head? Like, yeah. no, they're, they're, they're come adults up with now. They have language come skills. Up with some they can... situational comedy from that. All right. I want, an, I want an answer that will get some people pissed. No, I have an answer that will get some people pissed because it's a sacrilege for as long as we're discussing 90s intellectual properties, specifically Nickelodeon. But I just, I just never liked Action League now. Ooh. And I know that for some people, that's heresy. They crucify upside down for that shit. But Kablam's I hard to go back don't to. like it. Kablam, I've tried. I tried the other day in the train on the my commute home to watch some Prometheus and Bob, and it was not funny. Yeah, and there are I'm 32. Things, so. <laughs> Prometheus things, and Bob was never that funny. I was an Action League Now kind of guy, but it maybe doesn't hold up. Do, uh, like, I love that the ma- the villain is called the mayor. He's the mayor. 
yeah, yeah. Who does he talk like? I don't remember. But um, bad Jack Nicholson impression. <laughs> they all accept yeah. that he's the mayor, and I remember finding, oh, it's so funny that like the main villain in their lives is just this elected official, and they can't do anything about that. And <laughs> yeah. now I kind of like get that. it. I think. But yeah, <laughs> actually, yeah, they now, got a laugh out first laugh in twenty years. They all the pratfall it. humor of actually now is just lame, though. It's just uh, yeah. it, it's who is that piece of shit that's not as good as Gumby? Uh, Mister Mister Bill. Mister Bill. <laughs> Uh, it's it's basically Mr. Bill. So, oh no! Like they're gonna yeah. get they, now he's gonna get knocked over. Now he's gonna melt. Now he's gonna like be knocked over. But again. I was into that shit. I was the Sid when growing up, <laughs> and I, me, me and Emmy used to you know mess with our toys and do all that kind of stuff with them. But even as a kid, you didn't find it funny, Ryan. I watched Stick Stickly. <laughs> yeah, and he was more entertaining. Like I you like could Stick do Stickly. low budget and live action Nickelodeon. And go like, and this guy like delivers. He's a popsicle stick. Neil knows, obviously. <laughs> I can still sing <laughs> the song. I yeah, with googly eyes and a little nose and a little mouth, and he was so, has so much more goddamn charisma and charm and like presence than this this show that just just did not do it for me. Um, I feel like this next question we already covered in our discussion, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Lex asks us, do you think the humor for Invader Zim holds up in this day and age, both the show and the new movie, or is it too outdated? We did talk about this. I feel like we, it's great. we covered it, but I, I'll, reiter- I'll reiterate it. Um, at least the, the version of the humor that's presented in the movie yeah. um, feels, it does feel like, oh, you can tell it's from that era, the... The outbursts, I think, the uh, what you would call random humor yeah. in it. Um, but we, you and I it, watched an episode of the show before the movie. We did we watch were- one episode. I'd like to return to the show a little bit more before I make this judgment call. But yeah, it is really good. It, it the a lot of a lot more of the humor than you remember does come from the animation and finding funny angles and funny visuals and the voice acting, the humor that comes from the voice acting and and letting the characters do chaotic things and be non sequitur uh, really does work. I think the imitators were so much worse. Oh, it's yeah. one of those cases where imitators and people doing impressions of the show uh, kind of soured you on the style of humor that it was putting down. Um, but I, I, I think I think we have enough safe distance now that. Like I said, I'd love it if there was a new Invader Zim show, if they brought it back and they used this slightly updated version of that humor. Um, and I, I think it would do really well. I, I don't think it would. I don't think it wouldn't resonate with uh, kids. You know, there were moments in the movie. First of all, does the humor work? It does work here. Yeah. And like we said before, there are moments in the sh- in the show as the show is the show that ran for two seasons, and by the end of the second season. First season was 20 episodes long. Second season was seven. By the end of the second season, they'd actually run out of steam. Two seasons, a long time ago. But there were moments during this where Zim's overconfidence and ridiculousness and over the top and like almost reveling in how evil he is. Maybe think of Eric Cartman, of all things. I'm like, oh yeah, you were a contemporary of Eric Cartman. That was on the same, a lot of crossover in those two audiences who would have been familiar with both, and to see it's weird, do I like Zim better than Cartman? Of course, of fucking course I do. Yes, yes. Uh, Invader like, Zim is never, ever going to make a point about anything in society. No. Other is, than, like, consumer... Yeah, capitalism is evil. Yeah. You like it. It's always going to be very um, Rocco-esque in that it's just... Uh, it's there for flavor, not so much to make a point that the creators want to make, which is not the case with, with South Park. South Park is very political and very... Preachy, preachy, yeah. It, it's it. South Park is like such. It pretends it's apolitical, and it's such crap. Yeah, that's just a dump on South Park. But yeah, I'm. I'm just. I got over it. I, got, I get, We it. could spend a whole podcast yeah. <laughs> about how it's easy to shit on why baby boomers have a very bizarre, inflated sense of themselves. But to see the first Gen Xers not go not so gently into that good night to go like ooh to be to aid so gracelessly. Yeah, South Park is not holding up. Uh, so I got, here's another one. Uh, I'll, I'll ask like one more Zim question. Uh, okay. Jace McLean, nuclear bubble rap asks, oh. Hey Jace. <laughs> I'd like to see you all touch on the bloody Gur Easter egg. Cause it's one of those really fun, freaky things about Zim that sent the fan base into a frenzy when it was discovered. Um, and also I remember this. Yeah. Can Go you on, explain this? I looked you? it up briefly. Basically there was supposed to be some animation early in the show where Gur looked like he was covered in blood. 
And Nickelodeon said no. So Vasquez and Co. went through, and there's at least four or five, you can find articles about this, uh, instances in the show where they snuck in this image of Gurr covered in blood. And wow. it's like in like reflections and things like that, or if like Gurr was looking at a TV, and then it cut to the TV screen, you'd see a reflection of Gurr, it'd be that exact frame of animation. So it was there. You could like pause it on your VCR and find it. Wow. Creepy. It's like a, yeah, it's a creepy pasta right it there. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Honestly, it's like where that stuff came from. So there's bloody Gurr. Cool. The real thing. Um, the second part of Jace McLean's question is, um, oh, I mean, I guess we're. I guess that was it. We touched on it, right? Like that, that was like the story. Now, yeah. if, is there a bloody Gurr in the Netflix movie? I, I wasn't looking for. Oh, it. that'd be great. Maybe. Oh man, I wonder if they're too old for that. I I wouldn't want to do it. But if they did it, I'd still think it was cool if they <laughs> threw it. In Maybe the Nickelodeon movie. finally put their foot down. Just. Just stop it. We told you not to put bloody Gurr in it. Yeah. We're not letting you do it we this time. We can have blood on Netflix? Like, you can have Kevin Spacey on Netflix. It's amazing Man, what you can get. A- aren't you guys glad that- Let me play Zim. <laughs> neither neither Rocco or the Zim movies went, like, PG-13 R-rated. The exa- that was the other fear. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they didn't, like, push the buttons too hard. There was no, like, double on top. I mean, I mean, Rocco always has some of that. But like sure. I, I like the Simpsons movie, but and again they were the fact the Simpsons has been is a different uh, uh, animal of a different color, uh, but to, to know like hey we finally get to do some things we've we've want we sat on for decades. What if Bart drinks alcohol? What if we see Bart's yellow penis? Yeah. Like finally, like really you were looking forward. <laughs> this is what <laughs> you're looking last. forward to. Like that is a good. Do that unity. is a good joke. Though. I do like that joke, it's, but I can see why people don't. Yeah. Some people really are turned off by it, and I understand. I. But again, the point is not that you want to see Bart's penis. It's just that like you're not expecting to. Yeah. Well, it's an Austin Powers joke flipped on its head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the idea of like, oh, maybe Mr. Bighead finally swears. Like, no. I don't what, cares. what would we gain out of that? This, You know what? Hey, when they rebooted a long, long, long time ago, Red and Stimpy, and made all these mistakes. Yeah. They all these every gross, mistake. Every mistake. stupid, like, we finally see Red and Stimpy swear. Like, first of all, we actually saw them swear a little before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's amazing what they got away with, but... Like then, uh, it's almost like the joke doesn't work. It doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, there's just... no rules. It's just chaos. Yeah, yeah. It's fun to see them like work around restrictions. So, yep. uh, Jace McLean also asked, um, "Do you think Zim had a hand in influencing uh, modern shows like Adventure Time, Gravity Falls, Steven Universe, um, Rick I, and Morty?" Right? Yeah. I mean, God, if you want to look at a show that's influenced by Inventor Zim, Rick and Morty. Is... And, I, I did not piece that together until we were watching this special. And Justin Roiland. Justin Roiland is actually in the in doing voices in this. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, I've, I've actually only seen a few episodes of Rick and Morty. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think you and I, wa- I showed you like four in one day. You just did. so you got the idea. And honestly, the first few episodes aren't the best ones by any stretch. But I, I still really enjoy I, I enjoyed it and I enjoyed it in a way that I really enjoyed this new Invader Zim special. High concept sci-fi. Yeah. High concept sci-fi. That's just kind of woven into a. Uh, original char- fiction. Uh, original, yeah, like with uh, with kind of chaotic characters who have semi improvised dialogue. Uh, a lot of yelling, yeah, but they, yeah. they don't talk over each. Like you said, the, a lot of drool. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, yeah, and that the, although there's Rick and Morty doesn't have booger jokes like Rocco's Modern Life, but there's a lot of slime, there's a lot of gunk, there's a lot of blood. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like I was saying before about the when in response to would you want Zim to come back again for either a mini series or another special? Uh, by the way, a Halloween special would be great. Ooh, I yeah. love that. But I like the fact that should there be more, if there's going to be more Zim, they'll almost certainly take their time, and that was what will make it good. By the end of the show, they'd run out of steam. Like, yeah, I've been belaboring this point. By the end of the show, they'd run out of steam, and it showed. But they took their time on the Christmas special, and I went, great. The Christmas special awesome. was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. they did. They, it's exactly what I want. They took a really long time to get to this movie, but like, yes, ex- yeah, thank, nothing was rushed here, and you didn't waste a second. Our next question is from Jeremiah Allworm, and Jeremiah asks, throughout the 90s, what TV shows did you find important enough to record on a VHS tape, Ooh. and how frequently would you replay and rewatch those sweet, sweet tapes? Uh, when I was very young, I mean like three, I already had a firm understanding of how VCRs worked. Yes. I used to record the real Ghostbusters every Saturday morning, so I wouldn't have to miss breakfast with my family. Mm-hmm. I'd hit record, I'd walk away. Um, I really wish I still had that tape somewhere, but that was the first show I remember. Ooh. Like, I gotta catch this show. I'm trying to remember uh, some of the good ones. Um, I wasn't too big on taping personally. I would watch the shows when they'd come on, and sometimes I'd tape them if I couldn't make it. 
I remember uh, when I got into Mystery Science Theater, this was a little later, uh, coming out of the 90s or late. I record a million MST3Ks yeah, too. Yeah, well, I remember, I remember, I, remember uh, I think there was a time when I didn't get the sci-fi channel. So Jules, our friend Jules, really? actually recorded a bunch of episodes <laughs> oh, for me great. and he'd bring me the tapes and I'd watch them. And um, So Kingston didn't, but Bridgewater did. For a little while, oh, I think. Shit, yeah, that's crazy. Um, and I have vague recollections of recording maybe X-Files or King of the Hill, stuff like that. MST3K for you, Ryan? Yes. Well, all right. You want a straight answer. The straight answer is Power Rangers. But it was my brother and I, because we were only a year apart, we had a, v- uh, yeah, we had a VCR in our mother and father's home in, in where we lived. But every summer, we got uh, shipped off to live with uh, the grandmother because my parents had to work. They just couldn't provide full-time child care. So the vast majority of my growing up cartoons, my Nicktoons experience, my sneaking to watch The Simpsons was in an environment where I couldn't record them. There was not a VCR where I watched, like, where I consumed the vast majority of that content. Mm -hmm. What is a damn... I could buy one today. Like, ooh, I could go get a a VCR that... Uh, but yes, I distinctly remember recording Power Rangers episodes thinking, oh man, they won't be on again. I was wrong. They're <laughs> actually, still, yeah. they're still I, going. I want to say, yeah, I, actually most of the, uh, like the movies recorded off TV, I think my great grandmother had some of those and they were often uh, multiple movies on one tape. You could yeah, they put it in the EP too. mode. Yeah, yeah. Oh like, yeah, they should figure out like eight hours, one tape. I'm getting my money's There's worth. There's six so hours of empty space in this tape, but I'm still going to miss the first two minutes of the movie. Yep, you always <laughs> miss the first two minutes of the movie. But then you have these weird associations between unrelated movies. Yeah. Like here's the, yeah. the Goonies I, and The Firm or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> the Firm by John Grisham. The Firm by John Grisham. <laughs> I will say, cute anecdote, I have a friend who recorded, and unfortunately all these VHS tapes got destroyed in a, in a basement flooding. They recorded all from the Bronco chase to the acquittal, <laughs> all of the O.J. Simpson trial. And they foolishly, I will say, they foolishly kept them in that basement. That No, they foolishly <laughs> clearly kept them in a basement that flooded, but they also foolishly started and stopped at all the commercial breaks. And to me, yep. though, oh, those commercials would have added so much more richness. Oh, we just loved complaining about our commercials in the 90s and skipping past them. And um, we I don't blame you. Seek them out on YouTube. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, the, the old commercials, yeah, because it's a trip. But um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of commercials that are just not online anywhere because, you know, it's hard to find someone who happened to capture one. The people that capture old VHS tapes of like television broadcasts and upload them to YouTube are a special class of heroes. They're saints. Yes. I love, I love those compilations. Especially like Christmas 1990, like just like watching like a night of TV and you see like the old like, like commercials for like Pillsbury. Oh yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. even, I don't even care if it's a year I remember or if it's like a local station that has local like Alabama businesses and stuff. Yeah. I love seeing that stuff. I got a good question here from Mark Hughes. Mark Hughes asks, what's something that you really love that the other two members of Guaranteed Audio don't get at all? Hmm. That's a hard question. I wish I'd sent that to you earlier today because that's a good one. I, I feel like anytime one of us is like, oh, I want to show you something, like you guys have put up with a lot of shit I've tried to show you. <laughs> like I can't think of anything you've been like, I can't do this or like you make fun of me for liking or vice versa. I will say, you guys, Kevin, for those listening at home, which is all of you, Kevin and Neil have not yet watched all of BoJack Horseman. That's true. I haven't tried BoJack. I, I haven't even that doesn't mean we it. don't like it. Exactly. And you will. I guarantee. I guarantee. I'm not making that a thing. <laughs> I guarantee that they, they, they guys, they're both, they're both going to really love it. But I have talked about BoJack a lot for years, but they just haven't watched it yet. I haven't watched BoJack. Um, you got me an Animal Collective CD for Christmas one year, Ryan, and I, I couldn't get it. I tried it a few times. I couldn't get into Animal Collective. I don't know if that counts. And that would count. I, yeah. I one of my whenever I like when people ask me what my favorite television show is of all time, it's Breaking Bad. But I always make a I try to make a short list, top five, top ten, and it switches around. One intellectual property that's on my list that Kevin Neal is just not in their vocabulary. It's not in their uh, toolbox. I really love Wilfred with Elijah I watch, Wood. I watched the pilot with you. Yeah. Again, uh, I just never saw it. I, Wilfred makes it to like my top five sometimes. Mm. And I think it's really good, but it's never going to be number one. No. Yeah. <laughs> Something. I don't know. I mean, we all have our own in, individual interests that we don't necessarily share with each other so we don't have associations with e- with each other like uh, i don't know there's like a venn diagram like the talking heads is not like my favorite band but i still like them you love talking heads yeah 
Uh, I, I imagine you don't hate Bruce Springsteen. Right. No, I like Bruce Springsteen. He's Ryan, not my he, favorite artist, but yeah. I, I like hearing him. And mostly I hear him with you. <laughs> yeah. My guy's Bowie and the crossover yeah. between Bruce and Talking Heads. And he's, he's crazy. Of course it's there. Who the hell yeah. doesn't like David Bowie, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nazis. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, he, he was on their side for a little bit with that. that I know. Movie. That's the worst part. He's done everything. Like, yeah, I know. Sometimes it ain't good. Nope. It's not good. Um, I suppose uh, I, I have a lot of familiarity with, uh, with, with 90s adventure games and the LucasArts stuff. And you guys just haven't played those or, or seeked them out, really. Um, no, I've played. I played a few of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the wonderful the, the property with the detective, the, the rabbit and the dog? Sam and Max. Sam and Max. Police. They look great. I've, I've never played them. Yeah, I don't look at them and go like, fuck him. Like, <laughs> no, of course not. But yeah, they just weren't part of something I did growing up. Yeah, that's true. I think uh, we all had individual things that we latched on to growing up that we're still very nostalgic for that, um, that, that come up every once in a while, but just like aren't a crossover I, it is the, the way with the i had a i had a die in a hill with neil years ago and you did come around on this mm -hmm. uh, the first time you watched dark man you hated it you yeah. made fun of it a lot and i was so mad i'm like what fuck you dark man's wonderful and like, yeah. like i like i got real argumentative about it ryan you've always liked dark man oh, right? i love dark man yeah, yeah. yeah I really dark like man's it. well last time i watched dark man it was one of the good times yeah uh, every other time i watch dark man i either it's just too much and i and i <laughs> well, resent it. movie that's too much what are well, you talking about yeah. i don't know you know it's <laughs> It uh, works sometimes, and other times it's it becomes a Spider-Man, you know. It's a, it's, a, it's a real Ernest goes to jail kind of thing. Sure. Like you got to be in the right mindset. Kevin and I have talked ad nauseum about this, but I don't think it's ever come up in one of our podcast recordings. He really loves Moulin Rouge, yeah. and I should. <laughs> oh, I, I like should. Moulin Rouge. It's I like hate made it. for me. No, yeah, all it, right. I mean, it has every element. Is there's they do nothing wrong, and like. And I just, I just, I totally get shit. why people hate it. I totally yeah. get it. Like, I like Gatsby too, but it's also because I hadn't read Great Gatsby before I saw Baz Luhrmann's adaptation of it. Sure. So it's kind of like seeing um, Across the Universe and not really liking the Beatles so much. Yeah. Like, I didn't really know the Beatles, and I saw Across yeah. the Universe. I'm like, yeah, this is pretty good. And All right. Well, like, that's because you like the music, dickhead. The music. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm tolerant of Marvel movies, and you're not so I'm much. I'm over it. Yeah. And I don't know where you stand. You'll you'll watch them at least. I go back and forth. Sure. Yeah. But I, I don't die on a hill for the DC stuff either. Like I, no, I, I, mean, I, still, I, I point fingers of shame at people when they tell me they saw, uh, uh, what was the worst one? Suicide Squad. Like people tell me they saw Suicide Squad and it was bad. I'm like, yeah, of course it was. Of course it was bad. <laughs> you didn't see the writing on the wall with that one. Fair, yeah. Uh, but other than that, it's just like you guys have video game that you talk about that I will probably never check out. I don't know. Like, We'll get you to check out the old Resident Evil someday. Ryan yeah, Murphy hates not. Rudy, but that's a discussion for another day. <laughs> yeah. Hates it to death. Tell you what, let's do we have time for one more? Um, Something solid. Uh, one last question. Uh, Duncan writes in to ask, how long has that spider been sitting on Ryan's shoulder? Wait, what? Ah! <laughs> <laughs>